Hey everybody, what's Hello. up? Hi. I'm Aiden Mattis. This is Wendigoon. I'm Aiden Mattis. No, wait. Who am you're, I? You're Aiden Mattis, right? Yeah. I'm Aiden Mattis. Welcome to the lore log. Is this I have live? been completely through. This is, is this, live, yes. I should probably tweet a link to it. I, I could have done that in the previous five minutes. I forgot to do that. I have already completely thrown <laughs> off. <laughs> My God. I for, see the gourd jokes. For, for those up, seeing the go. gourd jokes, if you don't understand the, the gourd reference, uh, we talked about Jonah on the last one, and there is a line in Jonah, Jonah 4 9, where uh, the Lord himself asks, Dost thou well to feel pity for the or dost thou well to feel anger for the gourd? Anger for the gourd, that's right. Yeah. Um great, great band name. Yeah. So uh, I I saw somebody wanted us to make a pity for the gourd uh yes, t-shirt. That that will happen, I promise. <laughs> But yeah, I'm, so I'm, I'm being productive. I'm I think I think all of us are Aiden at this point. Um, you know, I'm kind of like Spartacus. But yeah, yeah that's uh, that's yeah. how. <laughs> yeah. Tonight we're going to be talking about uh, the fall of Jericho, which is probably one of the only Bible stories that I remember hearing most recently from ancient aliens of all places. I'm not saying that's a good thing. Just saying, like I can't stand you. Every it's day. uh. <laughs> well, I love I love how if you read the book. You're like, oh, this is such an interesting story. I wonder what the symbolism behind the the seven days of trumpeting and the trumpeting seven times around the city and all that. And then ancient aliens is like the Ark of the Covenant was a nuclear super weapon. Is that what their take is? Yeah. That it was like some sort of super weapon and that it uh, generated it's a really, sound blast that really knocked not it the, over the walls. I, I did my productive stuff. It's really not <laughs> that complicated. It's just like, this is a sacred box. Yeah. Ancient Aliens is like... No, it's a super weapon. Oppenheimer. Yeah, it's literally. It's there. <laughs> literally how they deal with it. I think it's I think it's phenomenal. Oh, look, you got a fellow goat, goat man. The we're show. not goat people. Yeah, well, okay, sorry. You've sacrificed the goats. Oh yes. Yeah, I forgot how that did, works. Did I ever tell you the story of the night that I uh, joined the Masons? My buddy who talked me into it um, texted me. Or I texted him, and I was like, I'm about to go into, you know, do the initiation process. And he's like, oh, cool. I don't know if you'll be able to handle the goat, though. <laughs> and I was like, Jack, what he do you knew. Mean? I'm like, he knew. I'm like, Jack, what what do you mean the goat? And he's he just ghosted me. He just came in, <laughs> yeah, just did the red receipt. <laughs> that guy's <was> good. <laughs> I was like, that's 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 funny. He's it's evil, good, but it is in fact funny. One of the good ones. One of the good, ones. <laughs> one of the good like, goat on, people. Man. Oh my god, I Aiden. He's Aiden. And someone We're said all someone Aiden. Said, stop it. Someone said wrong drink. I will do Dr. Enough again when they sponsor me. Until then, I don't even know what a Dr. Enough is. Unless there's one in the fridge, which I find in a moment. Then I will. <laughs> in which he's, case, I will know what like, they are. I can give up Dr. Enough any time that there is none present for me to drink. Correct. <laughs> I'm, I'm on a strike until I find it again. It's not enough. <laughs> it's never enough. It's never enough. All right, but do you, I'm, I'm going to grab myself a cherry coke. Do you want to tell the people what we're talking about tonight in more detail? Yes, I will. Well, I thought you were about to fall. That would have been great content. Do that on your way back. Um, so tonight we are going to be talking about Joshua and the Wall of Jericho. Uh, now, Joshua, if you've been watching the previous episodes that we've done over on the Lore Lodge or this channel that you're watching now, uh, you'll know that... We've been covering Moses and a lot of the stuff that the children of Israel have been doing on their way out of Egypt. Well, this is immediately following the Exodus. Uh, well, immediate relative, like 40 years yes. later. Uh, it's following the Exodus of Egypt and is immediately after Moses' death. Whatever Joe... Jo I have Joan on the brain. You're, you're trying. Jo Joshua, thank you, takes over as the leader of the people of Israel. And Jericho is actually their first military campaign or conquest that they go on. Um, and we're going to talk about how that goes today. It's really weird. Yeah. Well, it's the title of this podcast. It is the Weird Bible. It's the Weird Bible um, podcast. You know, I think, as we tend to do with these, these historical books of the Bible, it's important to set the scene. Uh, we're looking at sometime after 1180 B.C. So this is the, the peak of the Bronze Age Collapse. The world that the Egyptians, the Jews, the Greeks, everyone knew 
was coming crashing down. And it wasn't just one cause. This is a lot like World War One, where there were numerous threads that all came together to cause a cataclysm. Mm -hmm. In this case, we've got famines, we've got trade breaking down, uh, diplomatic ties between countries falling apart, people's religions are beginning to clash as they become more and more complex. There's a group of mysterious sea people attacking the coastlines. It's just chaos left and right. It is bedlam. And amongst, amidst all of it, God has brought the Jews out into the desert because Moses was not being a good leader and he was like, you're not going to be allowed to see the Holy Land. So, uh, for 40 years. Yeah. We'll get to years. see it after that. Yes. You specifically. You specifically will not yeah, see correct. it. Everyone else will see it. They'll get there. Which, yeah. you know, rude, but acceptable. There's actually an interesting mention in some of the verses we're going to look about today that implies all the people who were born in Egypt are dead. Yes. Like at this point. Yeah. So the yes. only ones who are still there. All the men. All the men. All the men. Yes. Yeah, all the men who were born in Egypt are dead. Yeah. So, of course, nobody's circumcised. So Correct. they've got to recircumcise everybody. Yeah, which happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it is it's a little funny. That, the thing that goes down. You start, jo jo <laughs> you start Joshua. I love how there's some books of the Bible that kind of like take a while to get into the, the meat of things. And right. with, with Joshua, it's just like... So Moses just died, and you got to circumcise everybody yeah, because we're going to war. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not even uh, mentioned, like, we're not even going to, like, cover it today, but the opening verse of Joshua is, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass, the Lord spake unto Joshua, and that, that's it. It just it starts there. Not Moses dead. I'm in charge. Let's yep. go. Yeah. Do, and we don't even get an account of Moses' death, do we? We do in... In Joshua. In Joshua no, just no, uh, uh, um, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Yes, yeah. we get one at the end of Deuteronomy. Uh, but not from Joshua's account, yeah. correct. So uh, the, the death of Moses, the ending of Deuteronomy, this is outside mm -hmm. of what we're talking about today, but... Well, it's uh, context. It's context, yeah. So yeah, thank you for making me sound smart. Uh, so it says that in chapter 34, which is the last chapter of Deuteronomy, it says Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the Mount of Nebo to the top of Pisgah that is over Jericho, and the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan. So that's like a grand vision that God gives Moses in his final moments. Yeah. And it says, uh, and all the lands of blah, 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 a bunch of different places named. It says, and the Lord said unto him, this is the land which I swear unto Abraham. Which this is a beautiful moment, by the way, to like read the Bible through and to know that all the way back at Abraham, he said, your descendants, if they follow me, will inherit the promised land. I promise you. And in spite of everything they've done wrong, God's still fulfilling that promise. Yes. So he's saying to Abraham, who is now the patriarch of those people, this is the land Moses. I, I swore. Moses. What did I say? Abraham. <laughs> he's saying to Moses. <laughs> it's I don't have my doctor enough. <laughs> <right now. laughs> yeah. He says, um, which he says to Moses, this is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go on over thither, which is the mm -hmm. thing that was discussed. Uh, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died where in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Peth Beor, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto mm -hmm. this day. Yeah. Which is a wild, a wild verse. The idea that um, Moses was buried by God directly in mm -hmm. this valley. To this day, no one knows where it is. And then when you read the account in Jude, all the way at the end of the Bible. They still don't know. It's a, they still don't know where it's at, correct. But it says that Michael buried him. Yeah. Which the idea of the archangel of the Lord himself dragging Moses' body off that mountain and burying him in a place mm -hmm. no man could find is... It's I, I love cool. it. It's so cool, yeah. It, it's a pretty cool scene. And not only that, but it says in Jude that the devil contested for the body of Moses. Yeah. Like, it's not said here in Deuteronomy, but in Jude, it says that whenever... Moses went to bury, or whenever Michael, Michael went to bury, to bury Moses, Moses um, that the devil fought him over it and said, you, he doesn't deserve it because he's a murderer. 
mm -hmm. talking to about Moses because yeah. whenever Moses left Egypt, he had killed an Egyptian to escape. Yeah. So the devil's saying, you don't need to give him this honor. He's just a murderer. And <laughs> Michael tells him that their day of reckoning has not yet come, <laughs> which, ah! <laughs> I, I love that because Michael's literally like, shut up, Beelzebub. No, like, literally, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Michael's like, look, we know how this story ends. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> this, 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 this isn't your game. You're not even playing. They're like, yeah. you've been doing this since we were children. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Um, some, somewhat, after I did the uh, the Paradise Lost video, mm -hmm. they're just seen in it where Gabriel grabs Lucifer, and he's like, um, it is for your insolence, for your petty, that we're here, that the mm -hmm. garden is the last holdout of free will, blah, blah, blah. And uh, someone took the... You've seen Breaking Bad, right? Yeah. You know the scene where Mike's yelling at Walter? He's like, if you would have shut up, did your part, played the role. Someone sent me that video, but they photoshopped Lucifer and Michael's like artwork over him. <laughs> We'd all beautiful. be fine. We had a lab. We had guns. <laughs> Everything was going so well. You and your pride and your yeah. ego, which is weirdly aptly fitting. There's there's another uh, unto this day that I think is really interesting because it it shows you how recently after the events of Jericho the book of Joshua was written mm -hmm. because there well, it's the her name's Rahab right yes yeah. uh, the the harlot we'll use that term the biblical term yeah who uh, takes in the two spies that Joshua sends into the promised land her name right. is Rahab right. Uh, and she brings them in, and the the men of Jericho come looking for them, you know, because they're like, we know there are spies of the Hebrews here. We, we've been told to cast them out, you know, and, and execute them and all that. And she hides the two spies on her roof under a pile of flax rods. Uh -huh. And then the soldiers pass by. She says, I don't, I don't know where they are. They were here, but they're gone now. If you go that way, you'll catch them. Mm -hmm. And then she lets them out, but she says, hey, um, you know, since I since I scratch your back, you want to scratch mine you want to make sure that I help? Like, yeah. that I live. But you know, hidden within that, there is a, a conversation where she recognizes the God of Israel. And historically, we know that at least as early as the 800s BC, uh, the people of Canaan did worship a god by the same name as the Hebrew god Yahweh. And this would imply that several hundred years, even earlier than that. They were aware of him and that he was considered part of their pantheon. Now, a lot of people have taken the opposite tack on this and said, oh, well, the Jews took Yahweh from the Canaanites. No, there is no there's no evidence of Yahweh with the Canaanites prior to the 800s. Now, this implies that they did know about him. Right. But what it also seems is that the the worship of this specific deity that the Hebrews considered the one true God had spread. Uh, according mm. to this book. Now, as we know, later on, these the same exact group of people will end up worshipping that god as part of their pantheon. But this tells us that perhaps that was going on even earlier, and it allows us to date the book because after the events that we're going to talk about, there is a line that says that Rahab is dwelling within the tents of Israel to this very day. Right. Yeah, so we know oh, that this I is see, written I see what this is yeah, written yeah. in the life cycle. So, so Rahab has to be alive by the way it's written mm -hmm. at the time Joshua was written. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Because a lot of these uh, post-Pentateuch books, yep. uh, maybe not Judges because that covered a lot of time, but like uh, Ruth, um, Esther, stuff like that were mm -hmm. written pretty quickly to my understanding after the events happened. Mm -hmm. um, and Joshua was one of them. Yeah, that's a good point to make. Yeah, it's... It's very cool to come across it, and it's like, oh, this was written like this is pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At, at the very least, the oral tradition right. was it was established, but yes. you know, they're they're afraid. The people of Jericho, they know what's coming. The king, however, is obstinate and doesn't see this as a problem. He's got his own gods. This is kind of how a lot of people de dealt with being approached by the Israelites. Was well, yeah, you, your, your god's real, but so is mine. Right. Yeah. This is, this is how the Vikings, that, 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 by the way, approached the Christians. Correct, yeah. And it did not go well for them either. It did not. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you for ever said make it, that we make in and then hard. Fantastic. Makes what hard? November. No something. There you go. Figured it out. Ryan. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, so what, yeah. So what's interesting about 
uh, a lot of the accounts you'll see throughout the Bible, especially around now, is whenever they approach him, there's never the argument of like, well, your God's not real, or like, my God is real. It's always yeah. like, well, mine's better than yours. It, it, because there's this like pantheon-esque understanding the, the belief. The way that the ancient world, that religions interacted is, it, it was very much my dad could beat up your dad. Yeah, like that's that's much. really the attitude a lot of them had. There, everyone's gods were real. It was just mine or better than yours. Right. Yep. Correct. Yeah. 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 I think so. Uh, okay. So, do you want to get into it now, or sure? Uh, or did you have more? No. I mean, that's. I think that's the important stuff for for the context. For people understand when this is occurring, why it's occurring. Um, you know, the Israelites have not yet entered the promised land. They, but this is pre the split we talked about in Jonah. Mm -hmm. So they're still one people. Right. Um, okay. But they enter into the promised land. The very first city they come across is the city of Jericho. And Jericho is, it's established. It's got walls. It is a strong Bronze Age city. Mm -hmm. We hear about the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Moabites and the Amorites, all of these different groups who live in this area. Now, the Hittites, of course, the Hittite Empire would have been collapsing around this time period into right. its various successor states, which would have all still been Hittites. But Correct. you're likely... The Hittites that are being talked about in this book are likely not the Hittites that we talked about um, in last night's podcast where I'm talking about Darren Kuyu and all of that for anybody who watched that. Um, so they go into the land, and it's not said exactly who Jericho belongs to, but it seems to be implied that Jericho belongs to Canaanites because they have acknowledgement of Israel as God. They know who it is. Mm -hmm. The Hittites might be a little bit more eh, on that. So it seems implied it's Canaanites. Phoenicians, Proto-Phoenicians. This would have been about the time that the Phoenicians were starting to expand and colonize other places. Uh, Carthage would be another 400 years later. But they were beginning to do those trade routes that went far and wide. Right. So this city is one of the, the many Phoenician city-states. And God does not send... He, does, he, he gives Joshua very specific instructions. He's not to send all 12 tribes. He's to gather up the men of... It's uh, half the tribe of Manasseh. And what are the other two? That are in there? Um, of the other two of the 12 tribes? Yeah. Who he sins? Yes. Is it at chapter 2 or in chapter so. 1? Um, uh, no, that's the spies. Correct. Is it before or after chapter? It, he says it, I think it's probably in chapter 3, yeah. Okay. Uh, and removed and lodged and can't pass after three days. He, 2000, he's given them the specifications yep. for the passage. He also... When they make the passage, uh, the priests, while you search for that, Joshua sends the priests in with the Ark of the Covenant, and he's told by God that when the priests go in, a man from each of the 12 tribes is to carry the, the Ark. And when they go in, the water, he, he will magnify Joshua in the eyes of people the same way he did Moses. And what happens is they walk into the water, Joshua walks in, and the water is put aside. And they stand on dry land in the middle of the Jordan. So he's repurposing what he did for Moses to now do it for Joshua as well and show the people that Joshua is their God-chosen leader. Did you find it? Um, I find the part where it says, Take you one of each man. Now therefore take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe a man. It shall come to pass as soon as the soles of their feet bear the ark of the Lord, what you were talking about. The water shall be cut off. Yep. Um... When the people is it mentioning the sanctions of the tribes after that? Here, you just, just take it. <laughs> Do you want to explain the 12 tribes concept to everybody? Yeah, so the t original 12 tribes. <laughs> sorry, okay. No, 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 no. I don't even want to talk about it. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was just so fast. It was kind of funny. <laughs> it's, fine, it's, fine. Uh, it's the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and half the tribe of Menasseh. Okay. Yeah, but okay, 12 tribes. No, <laughs> no, 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 I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, tell the people. Um, so the 12 tribes originate from the 12 families right after they, during the Exodus, correct? Yes. Yeah, so during the Exodus, there were these 12 men who had their houses, so to mm -hmm. speak, camping in different parts of the larger group of Israel whenever they traveled out. And once they were out there... I, I think it's the descendants of Jacob's grandchildren. Yes, but they, yeah, they re-split back yeah, into the correct. Tribes, they're, yeah. they're, they're each the twelve families are named after the twelve children of uh, Jacob. Jacob. 
So you have the tribe of Reuben, you have the tribe of Gad, you have uh, the Levi, bit, the bit, Judah. yeah, Levi, Judah. The one that's mentioned a lot, especially in like Exodus, is the Levites. Yes, because they were. I don't know if they were the most righteous or they were just chosen. I'd have to see how the story progresses mm -hmm. for that to happen. But the Levites carry out most of the um, ritualistic or sacred actions. Like if I remember they're... correctly, Levi was one of the eldest sons, too. Yes, yeah. They, uh, so the Levites are all <laughs> like the priest class, so to speak. They, uh, they deal with building and taking care of the temple. Whenever it's in the move, uh, at, next to Aaron, they're like the religious leaders, yes. essentially, the Levites. Um, and then you have Reuben, who is a lot of the soldiers, if I remember yeah, correctly. There's Cohen, right? There's Cohen. There, there's 12 of them. Yeah. Uh, so. I can't remember all of them off the top of my head. The point is... And what, what's interesting with them is as this story progresses, as the story of Israel progresses, you see these 12 tribes go from like families and different classes to like entirely different subsections especially whenever israel becomes a kingdom they'll talk yeah. about some being at war with each other some allying with the enemies of others yeah, you get clans yeah, it's clans. essentially yeah. clans these 12 clans that rise up in israel and it's interesting to track where they all go and how throughout all of it uh the levites continue to be mm -hmm. a holy like surveyor essentially so much so that in a story i did with my sunday school class around mm -hmm. Uh, Elisha. It was during the time of Elisha, which is way, way later on than this. There is a man who tries to start his own religion in his house, which is a story we need to cover on here someday. Yeah. A man tries to uh, start his own religion in his house, so he gets gold from his neighbors and builds a statue. And he's like, this is a religion now. And he's like, wait, we're not a legitimate religion unless we have a Levite. So, there's, <laughs> so there was a random just homeless man walking through the city one day. And uh, he asked to stay at this guy's house who's starting a religion. And he's like, are you a Levite? And the guy's like, yeah, my parents were from the, the tribe of the Levites. And keep in mind, they're both Israeli. They're both in Israel, but it's a different tribe. And he's trying to get a Levite. He's like, oh, you're a Levite? Are you one of the priest class? And the guy's like, no, I'm just from the Levites. And he goes, ah, close enough. And he makes that guy the high priest of his house. <laughs> It's a very funny story. It ends with everyone dying. It's perfect. I don't know why we haven't covered that yet. We'll do that we'll later. Get to it. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. I, I was looking it up to make sure I had my figures right for who was part of the tribe of Levi, but some of the most important ones are Moses, Aaron, uh, Samuel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Ezra, and Malachi. Um, yes. Christ yes. is Judah. Christ is of the tribe of Judah. Yes. And one of the so that's the reason the name that he's t given by David, the Lion of Judah. Judah is so significant to us that doesn't mean a ton it's like okay judah that's a region in israel who cares but it was part of the prophecy that christ would not only be jewish but that he would descend from the tribe of judah in the direct lineage of david yes and david said that my um uh, my ancestor that's not opposite of ancestor, mm -hmm. descendant my yes. descendant that's to come that will take away the sins of the world will be the Lion of Judah. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's of the tribe of Judah, and he's the Lion, the forefront yeah. of it, essentially. Which is why that name of Christ has a lot of like poetic meaning to it. Yeah. And, both, and both the first king of Israel and the last king of Israel. The first true king of Israel, Saul not included, but yes. both of them are of yes, the, that's the Lion Yes, that's Judah. another way to look at it. Yeah, they were both of the tribe of Judah. They were both... Uh, they were both like uh, lines in their own right. Yeah. And David was said to be a man after God's own heart. Mm -hmm. So that also fits in. Yeah. They, we'll get to David eventually. David's arguably my favorite character in the entire Bible. Not uh, perfect. Not a perfect not, No, not perfect at all, but definitely one of the most interesting. Please do not cry for Did me. you see what said it? They're going... <laughs> <laughs> the Gord. The Gord. Someone made a YouTube account. The, the Gord itself. That. That's incredible. As demanded, oh my we do not idiot. <laughs> Weep not for me, my children. I am the Gord. The Gord. Incredible. <laughs> Someone did that. Someone took the time to do that. I love That's it. Amazing. I they, love it so did much. Did they say anything up here? No. Nope. They just they entered just, uh, with that. Yep. The gore, they entered as a gourd. Yeah, they were talking about yep. the Levi's tribes. And, yeah, wow. Incredible. <laughs> Well, that was excellent. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right. So, so anyway, that's where like the 12 tribes come. You'll hear, especially if we cover this part, you'll hear a lot of mention of them. There's like, oh, the, the sons of Reuben went over here and this happened to the Levites and that happened to the Gads and whatnot. Um, which one of them went missing? There's one who disappears from the historical record. There is one who disappears. Is and it I the Gads? I can't recall who it is. One of them head. goes missing and it's a whole 
root for conspiracy <laughs> theory like what happened to him did they become part of this did they get wiped out um but the big ones are like the levites judah reuben uh they're like the three most prominent heels. and the benjamites the benjamites come up a lot um, uh, a lot of the prophets were benjamites well, i mean there's correctly. 10 of them do eventually get get got well yeah they get got but to my understanding one of them just falls out of like the biblical record yeah they just go i'm trying to figure out who it was <laughs> just all because i know which one you're talking about but i'm like I can't remember who I, I hate how people like don't consider the Bible interesting, and there's literally like the legacy of the twelve tribes and their mm -hmm. story throughout Israel. It's some of the coolest stuff ever. One day I'm going to have to make a video about all of it. Yeah, I'll take eight, 87 hours. All twelve are still there in nine thirty after David and Solomon. Okay. Um, we don't have to do this. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to need to look into it now because it's driving me insane. <laughs> The Black Hebrew Israelites suggest that they're the Lost Tribe. I know that. Yes, I have heard that. Um, uh, I've also heard the which I like. I actually do like the Ethiopian Church because I think yeah, they're cool. They're pretty cool. They're very cool. But I, I've, I've also heard them say that they're the Lost Tribe. Yeah, which is not yeah. cool. Which is not. Which uh, well, uh, hold on. I, not all of them. Just yeah. I've heard proponents say that maybe they are. Uh, the Ethiopian Church is so cool because you can see where it starts. Mm -hmm. So to give. This it's is one of the oldest ones. This, yeah, this is totally off uh, <laughs> what the concept is, but I have to mention it. So in the New Testament, right after Christ dies, like days after Christ dies, the disciples are walking around Jerusalem and they're just like witnessing to people. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one of my favorite stories yeah. and missions ever. So they're just walking around the city and I think it's, it's not Peter. I think it, it's one of the Would early... it be Peter or Paul? No. They were the uh, it's, it's before Paul. Yeah. I think it... It's not Stephen. No. It's... Uh, James? It might be James, actually. I feel like James went south. M m one of the... Anyway, yeah. whoever it is. One of the disciples is just walking around the city, and they're like, I don't... God's dead now. Oh, no. What do yeah. we do? <laughs> like, uh, everyone was freaking out. And while he was walking around, this is also one of my favorite messages in the whole Bible, how it was delivered. There was an Ethiopian eunuch. Now, mm -hmm. to describe what that is, in Ethiopia, which is in Africa, the higher-ranked men would be made into eunuchs. And they were essentially, you could think of like, this guy was like a judge, sort of. Yeah. He traveled with the king and the high-ranking government class. Someone said it's Thomas. That sounds right, actually. That sounds yeah, right. Thomas. Yep. Okay, cool. Thank you. Someone did, wow, thank you so much, uh, thank you. Rodriguez Jr. I appreciate that. Yeah, Thomas. So anyway, Thomas was walking around, and he sees an Ethiopian eunuch sitting in a chariot from Ethiopia. So these guys from Ethiopia were in Jerusalem on business, and one of the essentially like they're judges. They're businessmen doing business. They're businessmen doing business. One of the judges is sitting up in his chariot just reading uh, it said he was reading the book of Isaiah. Yeah. And he's sitting there and he looks confused. So Thomas is like, I'm probably supposed to do something about that. Yeah. So he walks <laughs> over to him and uh, the, Thomas is explaining himself. It's Philip. Someone also said, Philip or Tom Okay. We're going back to one of the disciples. Now that they say Philip, I'm pretty sure it's Philip. But yeah. <laughs> what? Philip? Sure. Yeah. Stay with me, kids. I'm losing you. <laughs> Philip goes up to this eunuch, and the eunuch's like, I don't understand what the book is saying. And Philip says, well, what, what are you having trouble with? And the verse he's reading is, as a lamb before it she as a lamb before the slaughter is done, mm -hmm. so did the Son of Man enter um, his slaughter in peace. Or the, mm -hmm. the verse that's equating Christ going to the cross as a lamb going to, as the, the, lamb going to the slaughter, quiet, just letting it happen. And the eunuch says, how could the king of the world go dumb before his tormentors. Mm -hmm. And Philip gets to be like, I was there. <laughs> he, he, like he gets to say like, I witnessed this. And he says, I watched the son of man go to crucifixion in peace. Cause that's the God I serve, which yes. is an amazing like, you know, message in itself. But Philip gets to lead the Ethiopian eunuch to Christ and then uh, the eunuch's like, I want to join the church. So he's like, well, let's go get baptized. So yep. he takes him to get baptized. And it says he dips him below the water. And whenever the eunuch rises up, Philip disappears. 
He's gone. <laughs> and it says that uh, the eunuch goes, this was the work of an angel. Mm -hmm. So the eunuch, it says that he travels back to Ethiopia and tells everyone he knows of God. Okay, right. So that's changed servers. That... <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> okay, it was funny. <laughs> <Believe it not. laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> that was pretty funny. Uh, anyway, so after, after that step, yes, okay, it's Philip. Got it. Thank you. After that, um, in the, we never hear about the eunuch in the Bible again. Mm -hmm. you, and you've got to understand, the way missions work, there was a lot of like, they told this person from this region, this one from this region, and we never see it again. So we have no idea in the biblical context what happens after that. In the 1500s, whenever Christian missionaries from England went to Ethiopia, mm -hmm. and they started to make their way south into like the thick of it, they got down there and they're like, we're here to tell you the good news of Jesus Christ. And they're like, okay, why don't you tell us? And they're like, well, you know, he, he died on the cross. Or, and they, the Ethiopians were like, oh. Yeah, we know that guy. We already do that. <laughs> they're like, what? And they're like, yeah, here's our records. And aside from a few of the names being different, they had the Bible. Yeah, like, <laughs> like, the entire Bible. <laughs> they had like the entire Bible. <laughs> this group of people who, and it's interesting because for like, 1500 years people like us who studied the bible they would read about the ethiopian eunuch be like i wonder what happened to that guy i hope he did okay it's like he went and apparently spread christianity he, he the entirety of ethiopia pretty big yeah like he created the ethiopian church is so cool because it's out it's one of the ones that exists outside of yeah. like the standard history yep. of the church the ethiopian orthodox church the ethiopian orthodox thing. church but we get there and they're like oh yeah Jesus, that's our guy. Yep. <laughs> like, which is really cool. I love that story yeah. so much. And it's it's very interesting from a historical standpoint as well, because that entire area, Christianity was like for a very long time the dominant religion yes. across North Africa. Yeah. Until the Muslims came in. Right. Yeah. And then the Muslims just annihilated it. Yeah. For whole a whole like, lot of war, murder. Yeah. It like that stuff from, happening. From Jerusalem southwest across to the middle of Spain. They got rid of all of it. Yeah. And they just missed Ethiopia entirely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ethiopia's like, no, no. We're, yeah, they were we like, know. <laughs> like, I don't know. There's a lot of desert there. It probably doesn't lead anywhere. <laughs> and then he I'm went sure west instead. I'm, I'm sure there's no one over there. But yeah, so like the Ethiopian is one of the most true or direct routes of Christianity mm -hmm. in the world. Yep. And it's off of that one account. <laughs> which is really cool and yes chat i uh, the ethiopian orthodox church is pretty much the only reason we have the book of enoch today like yes, they are the yeah. only we don't have any versions of it from anywhere else we just have the ethiopic text yeah so it's it without them we would not have enoch yeah correct which is they, fascinating they also claim to have the ark of the yes Covenant. they do i don't know about that but they have one they have a church with one guy whose job is to walk around in a circle over a specific pit and they say it's down there but they won't let anyone check you know what i respect it I'm like <laughs> if, it, if it's down there you go guys <laughs> you kept it secret for this long you're doing I'm not, a good job I, 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 look it does it's not a needed thing it's just a cool thing so if you guys got it send me a pic sometime <laughs> i'd appreciate it but no, they are, um, they're very cool. Yeah. I, I, I love that story so much. Anyway, we, we've talked this long and have not talked about Jericho once. We needed to set the scene. We, yeah. It's an hour and a half long podcast, too. That's we, fair. Okay. The Jericho yeah. thing's over in two minutes. That's fair. All right. Anyway, <laughs> so I'll go ahead and get into it. So uh, as he was talking about earlier, this is in the time right after Moses is dead. And Joshua is now leading the group for the first time across the Jordan. This was this part I'm about to read shortly before they cross the Jordan, but it's right around the same time. So it says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of, uh, sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into a harlot's house named Rahab and Large there. So to give you some context, according to, I, I like the study Bible a lot, and it has a lot of like little place, place yeah. and location stuff. And so according to it, it says that Jericho was about five miles on the other side of the Jordan. So the group, the children of Israel are crossing the Jordan and then five miles away is the city of Jericho, which by all accounts is massive. Yeah. Uh, Jericho is not only a walled city, it is a city of walls. Yeah. Har um, Rahab, who it's talking about here, 
lives on top of the wall yeah. in a house. The place is so big that, you know, it's a but, but this is straight up like, you know, houses and, yeah, yeah, this is like Megalovania style. The walls of the city have houses in, inside them. Mm-hmm. Massive fortress. Now, again, the people of Jericho, very wicked. They're part of the Canaanites. We're all about some child murder and yeah. some pillaging and whatnot. By the way, that is not like Jewish propaganda from the the early, like, first temple period. Mm-hmm. That's corroborated by the Romans and the Greeks, and a lot of people went, ah, that's just Roman and Greek propaganda, ignoring the fact that the Jews also said it was real. And yeah. then eventually, uh, very recently, archaeologists came across uh, Phoenician temples and burial chambers with uh, vases that had the mutilated bodies of infants. They did commit child sacrifice in terrible, terrible ways. It, it is funny to me a lot of that because that's not the only time I've heard that. <laughs> you're, you're like, ha ha, did babies. <laughs> no, 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 I, I didn't mean. <laughs> Someone's going to clip that. <laughs> they, they found all these dead babies. You know, that's funny to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's my sense of humor. <laughs> um, I hate it here. What was I? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Jericho what, City of Walls. What constantly happens, and the, the part that's funny to me, mm-hmm. is that a lot of the time there will be people who do that. They're like, oh, well, you know, the, these enemies of the Bible, that was, like you said, Jewish propaganda or Roman mm-hmm. propaganda or whatever. And then they find these ritual sites and they're like, oh, yeah. Dang, Jews, right again. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, ah, yeah, it's almost like the Bible they were talking about. <laughs> but, um, yeah, they're, uh, so anyway, like, yeah, these people of Jericho, pretty wicked, pretty awful, mm-hmm. uh, and they are a hugely formidable force. Yeah. It's, a, it's, again, a wall that you live inside of. Gotta remember, the Jews are, are walking around the desert living in tents. Yeah. And there's there's 40,000 men that they can muster to fight. Yes, yeah. Jericho is an entire city. Like, they, yeah. they do not have the manpower yeah. to fight Jericho. Yeah. Pretty not good. Uh, so, so they're just like you know walking through the desert. Now, of course, the things that the uh, uh, the, ch- the children of Israel have that Jericho does not is God, and we're going to see that play mm-hmm. out. And what's really interesting is their conversation with Rahab. So Rahab lives on top of the city wall. So again, Jericho is a big city. There's visitors occasionally. So these two spies from Israel they walk into the city and they make their way into Rahab's house, and it says, and it was. Behold the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. So the king of Jericho, mm-hmm. again, this, these walls are so big they have a king. The king hears that two men of Israel have come in and says, And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. So these two spies come into Rahab's house, and then whenever the police essentially come looking for them, she hides them, as you mentioned, up in the roof. And uh, whenever they ask, where did these two strangers go? She says she she has no idea what they're talking about, that they came from, uh, but I know not whence they were. They went that way, Um, which is very uncharacteristic. What's also interesting, again, in the study Bible, is the mention that in the Code of Hammurabi, it's specifically mentioned that there is a particular kind of punishment for harlots mm-hmm. who commit acts of treason or deception against mm-hmm. the king. So interesting. I didn't know that. I, I imagine the death is the punishment's death. But <laughs> the fact that that was something that was yeah. specifically, you know, like thought out or a thing. So mm-hmm. she knew the consequences of what she was doing, mm-hmm. in other words. But she's still deciding to side with these two strangers. Mm-hmm. And the reason for it. It says, and it came to pass about the time of shutting of the gate, or dark, um, that the men went out, whither the men went, I won't not pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax. She had laid them under the roof, which is what you talked about. She put them up in the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan under the fords. And as soon as they which pursued after were gone out, they shut the gate. So they spent all night looking for these guys, couldn't find them. And it says, and before they were laid down, she came up to them on the roof. And she said unto the men, and this is Rahab, I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. 
For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. When ye came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Shion and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now, therefore, I pray you swear unto me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token. Okay, so this verse is wild because it puts into context everything the children of Israel has been through. Yep. See, whenever you're reading this from the accounts of the children of Israel, it's pretty much just them. And God goes, hey, do this thing. And they're like, oh, I don't know about that. That's kind of freaky. And then God does the thing. Yeah. And then they're then he's like, hey, do this other thing. And they're like, oh, oh no, I don't want to have to do that. So it's like it's like they are falling backwards and stumbling their way into being the most fearsome warriors on the planet. <laughs> and it's all because of God. It's because God promised Abraham and Moses, if you do what's and now Joshua, if you do what's right by me, I will. I will provide for you. I will fight your enemies for you. I will be your God. And it's so wild to think about every single time that something goes wrong uh, and the children of Israel are so scared and freaked mm -hmm. out and continuing to doubt him. Th think about it from the other guy's perspective. Think about like the first battle that Aaron and Hur did against the, I think it was the Moabites, whenever they get into a valley and the enemy army, a country is like, oh, he's a bunch of just random homeless people. Yep. Let's get them. And they get wiped out. Yep. They got eliminated. And then the two kings of the Ammonites are like, we got to kill them. And they get eviscerated. Mm -hmm. Like every single time they're losing. And it's so interesting to hear Ray, uh, Rahab say, we've heard about you. You're the one who crossed the Red Sea. You're the ones who defeated the Ammonites. You're the ones yep. who did dog. And you're a bunch of homeless people <laughs> with tents. <laughs> <laughs> who now have weapons from all the times they beat other people. <laughs> yeah, most of their arms are from the people who they've defeated in battle. Their, their weapons and armor are basically just stolen off the battlefield. <laughs> yes, yeah, effectively. So It's impressive it, stuff. It, it's to the degree that a woman who's living in, again, one of the most fortified cities in the country is willing to risk execution mm -hmm. by that same country because two people from these dreaded Israelites are in her house. And she's yep. like, no, <laughs> I am not messing with these two. Because if these are the guys who walked across water twice now and have killed all these armies, I'm not touching them. Yeah, it's also not the first time in the Bible that two Jewish dudes walk into a city and it doesn't go well for the city, but... You're honestly going to be more specific. Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Actually, Jewish Jews, those were angels. But... Oh no. Yeah. Well, I, I thought I thought you were making a reference to Christ. <laughs> no, no, no. It's uh, for those that don't know in the the story of the story of Abraham and Lot that Lot is like, you know, don't don't destroy the city. We can find good people. Um, and the two angels go in and. Uh, doesn't go well. Well, they went, they did go to find, like, God was, didn't just wipe them out. God yeah. was like, okay. If you can yeah. find a single righteous if you, man. If you can find 10, that was what he said. Yeah. It was like, if you can find 10 people in the city of tens of thousands. Sure. And then eight of them were Lot and his family, and they couldn't find two more. Yep. Uh, and whenever the angels went in, um, well, we won't get any detail about that. Yeah. The, it was the populace tried to do some bad stuff. The populace the tried to do some bad the stuff. The angels were like, well, let's, uh, let's get out of here. Um, don't, and, also, don't, don't turn around. You don't want to see what's about to happen. Don't, yeah. Um, yeah. So, but anyway, yeah. yeah. So, the, like, it's wild to think about all these people from other countries who are like, oh, we're not messing with the Israelites. They may be a bunch of homeless people in tents, but they They've got something going for them. Mm -hmm. And that's what Rahab says. Uh, it is proven that your God is the true God. Like yeah. you were talking about, there's all these multiple gods. But after this, Rahab's like, y you guys are the winners. Yeah. So anyway, she says, because I've hidden you, uh, show my father's house mercy, and that ye will say alive, oh, you're getting bots. I get those yeah, too. Yeah, Isn't that I fun? Get rid of the bots. Woohoo. Um, it says... Now, therefore, I pray you, uh, and that ye will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all they have and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered here, answered her, our life for yours 
if ye utter not this our business, and it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land, that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Then she let down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dealt them upon the wall. Mm -hmm. So after making this deal, she's like, I, I've hidden you. Uh, let us live. The men say, we won't do wrong by you and your family and whoever else comes into your house. Whoever's in your house, we won't buy. So she lets them down the wall and it says, uh, and she said unto them, get you to the mountain, let the pursuers meet you and hide yourselves there three days, essentially telling them how to get away. And the men said unto her, we will be blameless of thine oath, which thou hast made of swear, um, saying, uh, behold, when we come into the land, Thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window which thou didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of the house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head. And we will be guiltless, and whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be upon our head, if any hand be upon yeah. him. So they're like, you've saved us. What, what to do is this scarlet cord, this red rope that you let us down the city, Hang it out your window whenever we return. And if anyone's out in the city, if anyone's mingling or trying to fight back, we're blameless to that, even if they are your friends or family. But if anyone's in your house, that blood's on our hands. So essentially, it's a way, uh, an oath of saying if they're in your house, they'll yep. be protected. Um, and they continue, and it says, uh, according to our word, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. Which it's also, there's a ton of stuff like this in the Old Testament that's not explicitly said, but I do think it's a beautiful picture. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look back at the children of Israel in Egypt, the way they were saved was by painting the yeah. red blood over the doorway for the death angel to pass over. Now here with uh, Rahab, we have a red scarlet line out the window as the symbol that death should pass over. And there's a ton of stuff like that. There's a story with David uh, whenever he takes... Um, he marks the temple whenever his son Absalom's having his whole hissy fit. Mm -hmm. And he marks it with lamb's blood. Again, another sign of uh, like the blood covering up death, yeah. eventually leading to Jesus Christ and his blood being that red line for humanity. Uh, it's one of those beautiful pictures that as you read through the Bible kind of builds on itself. And so eventually, I think it's in the book of Hebrews, it describes Christ as the blood. Well, we hear the blood of the lamb yeah. all the time. But they, it specifically describes him as the blood of the death angel, which yep. cements that idea that um, this concept of the red, the blood being yep. our savior is. It's, it's just a beautiful picture that's shown throughout the Bible. And if I remember correctly, after the recircumcision of everybody, they mm -hmm. have, I think it's the third or the fourth Passover that they've observed. Yes. Yeah. Is observed before the, the siege of Jericho. Yes. Yeah. So that entire uh, point happens. The two men return. And they go to Joshua and said, uh, <laughs> the first thing they say to Joshua is, and they said unto Joshua, truly the Lord hath delivered into horror hands all the land, for even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. <laughs> <laughs> like, they get back and they're like, guys, you're never going to believe this. <laughs> they're afraid of yeah. us. <laughs> Because, because, like, the children of Israel have had no contact outside of a sword fight with any other, you know, group of people. They've just kept trying to kill them. Yep. So, Israel, every time that they're like, oh, God, I don't know if we can fight this war. I don't know if we can go up against this army. Meanwhile, the army was, like, shaking, yep. <laughs> going to fight these homeless people in the middle of a desert. I mean, and, and there's, like, uh, before this, in Deuteronomy, there's the entire episode where they go and they're, uh, it's the, the Moab moment. where. Yes. They get to Moab and, and God's like, all right, you're going to win. Just fight the battle. Yeah. And then the king of Moab is like, I'm going to sacrifice my son right in front of all of you. Yes. And he yeah. does it. Yeah. And it, the Israelites are like, oh, no, I'm scared. And they run away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like they win every single battle they fight. And I then forgot he... about that one. So <laughs> it's like, it, so, it does not, does to, not click to, for them. To, to get across <laughs> to you guys how absurd the scene he just described is. The children of Israel are freaked out by everything. Every fight, they're like, ah, oh, here it goes. We're going to die. And they never do. But they're like, here it goes. And on the other side, the Moabites were so freaked out that whenever they come to war, the king of Moab is like, look. And he kills his son <laughs> as like... The crown prince, like yeah, the heir he, of the throne. He kills the prince in front of the Israelites and is like, look, here, a sacrifice to you people. 
and the Israelites are like, this guy's crazy, and they run away. <laughs> They're both... <laughs> From the Israelites' point of view, they're like, oh, these guys are crazy. And then think about it from the Moabites' point of view. The king's like, look, as long as we don't have to fight you, I'll kill my child. And he kills his child, and the other side turns away. And then there's like, he's like, what are they planning? <laughs> these these people are monsters. There's, it's, a, it's a wild scene, because what the Israelites see is they see the, the king of Moab sacrifice his own son to his god Hamash. yes yeah and they're like oh my god Hamash is gonna kill us and yahweh's like oh my god yeah but meanwhile <laughs> god's like <laughs> he's like ah, okay like <laughs> moab's like he, it worked he's looking he's looking at that contract <laughs> with abraham he's like are you sure i can't pick anyone else <laughs> It's like there's gotta I, there's gotta be a loophole. God's sitting here like there's gotta be a loophole in here, and he's like, oh right, it's the Jews. Oh. <laughs> I have to please anyone else. Poor God trying to get his own lawyer, and they're all on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> it, anyway, so um, after that, what part were we at? <laughs> You got me caught up when you were talking about like the yeah we were at uh we were at um j just after uh they leave Rahab and they're in this recircumcision the Passover and they're getting yeah, yeah, ready yeah. to so, go to war so it's like hey look they're actually afraid of us whoa that's crazy um and then if you want to explain the circumcision part yeah you're, basically you're to talk about God it. God I uh, go to I'm Joshua. also gonna get a drink so yeah continue. so what what happened here is that like we said earlier in the episode. All of the, the men who came out of Egypt at this point are dead. The, all the men marching with Joshua, uh, I'm okay. If you give me a glass of water, I'd love you, though. Um, all the men marching with Joshua were born after the Egyptian exodus. So we're looking at, you know, some, some 30 to 40 years since the exodus here. Joshua is told to... Okay. Joshua is told that he needs to make some sharpened knives, gather them together, and then we're going to go and recircumcise the entire population. And I just, I, I wonder how Joshua managed to pitch this to everybody, but he did. He, he managed to convince everybody to go along with this, all of these adult men on the eve of battle, just cutting off the, the foreskins. Well, so I think context helps, because like right now we're like, ah, that sounds horrible, the idea of doing that. But circumcision was actually a thing seen not only in Jewish culture. Oh, it was only Jews, yeah. It was only Jews. Egyptians were very big about it for the same reason. It was seen as a sign of cleanliness, but above all else, it was like a physical devotion to God. Yeah. To the degree that not only uh, like the Jewish people, but several other groups of people would see um, the uncircumcised as godless people, people yeah. not there. So essentially what's happened is... Especially after the information that everyone else is afraid of us, Joshua was like, okay, we're going to do this thing right. We're not going to go in as a bunch of godless heathens who are just like fighting for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're going to do the circumcision. We're going to do the Passover. We're going to do the Ark of the Covenant. We're going to do all the stuff we're supposed to because we are God's people. We mm -hmm. are not going to act like a bunch of renegades. Yeah. Uh, Joshua's because, like, because they have a habit of doing that. <laughs> jo Joshua's a very good leader. He's a military. Jo He's arguably, a Joshua. Arguably, Joshua is the best leader Israel ever has yeah. in the Old he's, Testament. Early on, he's the the assistant to Moses. He is the, yes. the general of the Israelites. So when he gets appointed, he's like, there's there's a degree of respect and organization that follows him around. Yeah. And so when he tells everybody they need to do this, they do it and they trust in him. And they're like, all right, you got us this far. Where's the push? It's got to be powerful, too, as the people of Israel to be like... Um, I did not deserve the credit for Thomas. I was keep up the Lord's work. Thank you very much, Rodney. <laughs> Thank you. I, th I, I thought it was too, but yeah, it's Philip now that I say it. Yeah, it was Philip. Uh, because uh, whenever they got to the Orthodox Church, one of their like patron saints was Saint Philip, mm -hmm. which is adorable. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah. So the. Also, thank you everyone for the super chats and stuff. Yes, I know we're you. talking. We'll, we'll, we'll read we'll, a bunch we of will read all. We'll read them. But uh, I, I appreciate it. Even if we don't get to them right now, it means the world. So thank yes. you guys. Um, 
So it's got to mean a lot for the children of Israel to be afraid after the death of Moses. Like, man, this guy took us across the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. What's it mean now? And then to see Joshua take you across the yeah. Jordan, that, that's pretty phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's everything they needed to see to, to calm their hearts. I think it's also beautiful because we see that God, I talked about this a little bit in the podcast we did a couple nights ago, but that God never interferes with humanity's free will when he doesn't mm -hmm. have to. It's yeah. so like after Christ, you know, it's all just spiritual guidance and yeah. connection. Whereas in the Old Testament, it was, it needed to be much more physical at points. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting how God knew, or it's beautiful that God knew what Joshua needed yep. was a little bit of favor in the eyes of the people. Because it says, God told Joshua, I will magnify you mm -hmm. before them. And I think that's just like a, it's a very beautiful picture that uh, God's essentially saying, Joshua, you're cut out to be the leader. Yes. I've always known you would be. I'm just going to make sure they know that. It's, it's, it's very, it's very pretty. <laughs> it's a good, it, it's a good message all around. It is, yeah. But yeah, Joshua is a great leader. He's also the first judge. Mm -hmm. uh, so Israel has their time of judges whenever they get to the promised land. And then after the people say, we don't want judges and prophets and all that, we want kings. I was wondering why the viewership dropped by 200 people. And then I was like, oh, it's eight o'clock. All the political coverage is about to start. Uh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, watch this instead. It's better. Correct. More important, <laughs> unironically. So, so Joshua... Um, after the he's the first judge over the peaceful people of Israel, and after the people say we don't want judges, we want kings. Uh, a lot of the roles of judges are moved to roles of prophets that we see after that, uh, during the time of like the kings of Israel and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, yes, yeah, so Joshua was the first judge, very cool guy, very cool fellow. Um, so at this time, he's like, All right, we have the information from the spies, we're going to keep Rahab safe, uh, we're going to do everything correctly to be prepared for this thing by the book, Jericho, we're going to do it by the book. Um, and he, like the next few chapters go into detail about that, about, uh, the speech Joshua gives them. Um, I don't think this is where it says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It, it's around this time. I think yeah. it might be right after that. Uh, but yeah, Joshua gives them speeches as a great leader. Um, in one, I don't think it's this one, but in another part, he says, choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, yes. um, which is like a beautiful sentiment. He's got his um, he's got his foundation right in God. And anyway, I love Joshua. So he has got all of this figured out. He knows uh, what they're going to do and they're ready to do it uh, until we get to. And then we get to the end of chapter five when it begins. Yes. Uh, was there anything you want to say before we get into Jericho? Not before we get into the Jericho thing. Yeah, okay. I'm, all right. I'm ready to go. So, uh, all this has happened. It says, uh, that the people did eat, uh, and the man has ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. So the people are eating, they're getting ready for, the, this is also a very symbolic victory mm -hmm. because ever since over 40 years ago, when they left Egypt, they have been walking towards the promised land. Mm -hmm. And now that they have crossed the Jordan, they are here. And this is, they've been fighting people who've been trying to kill them before. This is their first time fighting for the promise. Yes. Um, so it's a big deal. So it's like the, the men are ready to fight. And it says at the end of chapter five, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? Because he's getting ready to survey uh, the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's just a guy standing there with a sword. Just armed. And just armed. And Joshua says, Are you for us or them? And, so, and he said, Nay, but as a captain of the host of the Lord, I am now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, what saith my Lord unto his servant? I love Joshua so much. Okay, so it's a great statement on leadership, too. It is. From, yes. From a biblical standpoint, what, what is being said here is what's being shown here is the man who's appointed to lead all of Israel by God himself. When when he when confronted with somebody who brings their authority directly from God, he immediately is subservient. He yes. he's yeah. not he's not vain he's not prideful he's not yep. like well who are you to come here and tell yes, me what to do exactly yes. it's 
thank you, Lord. I'm, yes, I'm yeah, your yes. I, like, I, I, what does the Lord say to his yeah. servant? Yeah, there's, there's the no. later on in the medieval period, you get like the divine right of kings idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is like almost the exact opposite. Correct. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There's a, the, what you were saying. There's this idea that a lot of kings are like, oh, they're a member of God's yeah. covenant who's meant to lead man. But here, Joshua, the appointed leader, vows himself, which for those that don't know, what he just met was an angel. Yeah. The person before him with the sword was an angel. And as soon as Joshua finds that out, he falls to his face and worships and says, what does the Lord want his servant to do? Which, and given the context, it's probably Michael. There's a good chance, yeah, the yeah. captain of the host of the Lord. Yeah, this could very well be the archangel, the one who, uh, uh, the one who yeah. will at this current point, 2022, the one who will body Lucifer <laughs> in the future. It's it's probably the same guy Daniel's talking about when yeah. the angel approaches him and's like, "I'm sorry, it took me so long to get here. I was fighting with the prince of Persia." I was fighting the prince, like, which is a, we'll get there. Yeah, that is, <laughs> that, that's yeah, the, all the, the yeah. chief prince came and helped. Yes, me. He's talking yeah, about Michael. Yeah, that's yeah. what's you know. This is probably the same idea here. Yes, yeah. So um, here we have Joshua approaching, and he says, I, I'm at the Lord's command. What does he want me to do? And it says, And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. Joshua did so. Okay, so the significance of this, yeah, for one, like we saw a lot of times earlier whenever Moses... Um, had these conversations with God. Sometimes he was pretty haughty. I say mm-hmm. sometimes. A lot of the time he was pretty haughty. Most of Moses' fault came from his rage against God. There were times where he had, uh, we talked about whenever he went to get the Ten Commandments, he mm-hmm. talked to God for like days. And the whole time he's just like, God, <laughs> I don't think you know what's going on down here. I think we should change this, blah, blah, blah. Versus Joshua, who immediately says, what does God want his servant to yes. do? Which is why I, I do think Joshua... He learned from Moses' mistakes. He's learned from Moses' mistake. But he never questioned or fought against Moses. Yes. He never. He was always there by his side as a friend. Mm-hmm. And here, he's just being better because of what he's experienced. Um, I love Joshua a lot. Anyway, <laughs> but the part about his foot from holy ground is whenever God first visited Moses, all the way back, way before he ever went to Egypt, he told Moses... Um, the first time they ever communicated to take off his shoes because he's standing on holy ground. And to see that here, that the first time as the leader of the children of Israel, that the angel says the same thing to Joshua that he did to Moses, that this is a sacred ground that you're being commemorated on. Yep. It's beautiful. I love stuff like that. So anyway, uh, it says, uh, this is, we are now to chapter six, which is yeah. the story of Jericho. Uh, are they saying anything? I timed this perfectly. Oh, look at that. 805. Look at that. Whoa. See? That was impressive. All right. I doubted you. <laughs> Only an hour intro <laughs> for the story of Jericho. Perfect. Uh, anyway, so in chapter six, it says, Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. Think about that. Like the, this city, again, the walled city, this superpower effectively mm-hmm. at the time. Is not letting anyone come out or any any of its people go out or any strangers come in because they are horrified because they saw two people from the children yep. of Israel, which gives a testimony for how effective they are. I saw someone make the joke earlier. They were like, uh, how accurate was the VeggieTales version? Which surprisingly, pretty accurate. <laughs> but it was pretty accurate as far as the events go. But the difference was in the VeggieTales version, they're like mocking and yelling at him, which we'll see a bit later. Mm-hmm. But they were also terrified yeah. of them, especially considering what they do next. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, it says, now Jericho was shut up. And it says, and the Lord said unto Joshua, see, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. He's, he's like, mm-hmm. Joshua, you, it's in the bag. <laughs> you, <laughs> you got, got it. it. And ye shall compass the city and ye men of war and go round about the city once. Thou shalt do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram horns and seven, uh, and the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. And Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said unto them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram horns before the Ark of the Lord. 
And he said unto the people, Pass on and compass the city, and let him that is armed pass on before the ark of the Lord. And it came to pass when Joshua had spoken unto the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets and ram horns passed on before the Lord and blew with the trumpets and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. And the armed men went before the priests that blew with the trumpets and the real word came after the ark, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. So what's happening here is God went to them and said, all right, you're going to take the ark of the covenant, which has a lot of significance with uh, the children of Israel up to this point, it contains stuff like uh, manna from heaven, the Ten Commandments, Moses' staff. Uh, a Some sort of sonic super weapon, apparently. Uh, apparently, a, apparently a nuke, according to ancient aliens. <laughs> it's a very special box. Um, and part of the rule was that the Ark of the Covenant is very sacred. You're never supposed to touch it. And the only people who are to touch it are the priests or the Levites, as mm -hmm. we mentioned earlier. So he says, you're not going to go to Jericho with a bunch of weapons. You're not going to go ready to fight a war. The priests are going to carry the ark, and that's that's all you need. There's going to be men in front of the ark with swords to protect the ark, but you're not going there for a fight. You're going there with me. Because the symbolism of carrying the ark is that you're signifying God is with us. You're carrying God with you're us. You're carrying God with us. So you're going to carry this image of God around the city. For seven days... You're going to do it for six days. You're going to do it once. You're going to circle the city, go home, circle the city, go home. The seventh day, you're going to do it seven times and everyone is going to blow their trumpet. Uh, so it says Joshua does that. <clears throat> and then it says, and Joshua had commanded the people saying, you shall not shout nor make any noise with your voice. Neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout, then you shall shout. So they just in silence walked around the city. Could you imagine what the Jerichos were thinking during these six days? Probably what? <laughs> <laughs> the, these are the people who everyone's like, they, these guys literally walked across water. I am horrified of them. Mm -hmm. I do not want to deal with them. And then they show up, just a few of them, with a box. <laughs> and they circle you and they go home. Yep. And then they circle you and they go home. <laughs> it's it's got to have been like the most unsettling thing to see. Like, just because <laughs> every day you're expecting that they're going to show up with the ladders and the ram and all that, and they just show up with a box. And they just walk, just walk around. Just walk, there's nothing to see here. We're not bothering nope, anyone. We just, just have home. a box. Because <laughs> it would, it would ha you'd, you'd have to be so on edge at that point. Right. Like, wondering, what is this some sort of distraction from? Like, what, what are they doing that they're trying to make me not notice? <laughs> and then, at the end of the day, like this this is exactly what you were supposed to notice this was the thing right yeah <laughs> this is it so anyway and yes i see that the gourd said he's the gourd in the is ark. in the ark gourd's in the ark sure anyway <laughs> <laughs> so jonah was well after this my it's the gourd the, you don't have slow mode on no you did this to yourself yeah, <laughs> you, you've created this monster I, it's probably my anyway <laughs> it says so <clears throat> So the ark, and I bid you, uh, yeah, so the ark of the Lord compassed the city going about it once, and they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. And seven priests bearing seven trumpets and ram's horns, for the ark of the Lord went out continually and blew the trumpets, and the armed men went before, and he's continuing to do all the stuff that God says. The second day they do it again, so they did six days. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose up early about the dawning of the day, and compass the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day, they compass the city seven times. So they did it once every day. On the seventh day, they did it seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time, when the priest blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. And the city shall be accursed, even it, and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed, saying, lest ye make yourselves accursed, when ye take out the accursed, saying, and make the camp of Israel a curse, and trouble it. But all the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So essentially what Joshua said here, is after they've done it seven times, the men at the front who've been holding the trumpets in silence up until this point begin to blast them. And Joshua tells the people, the city is ours. We've done it. Whenever we walk 
The city, there's a giant wall behind him. He's yeah. like, whenever we walk through this destroyed wreckage <laughs> that's about to be right here, he says, whenever we walk through it, don't take anything out of it. Everything that's in here is the accursed, as he said. Yep. And as you mentioned, group of baby murdering mm -hmm. killers. Yeah, it's all accursed. None of it's to be yours. It's evil. He says, only the gold and the silver we take, and that is going to the Lord's treasury. or yeah. uh, It's going to be consecrated in the temple, essentially. Like, what's of monetary value we're giving to God? Do not touch anything else. And do not keep any of it for yourself. Which we won't get to yeah. tonight, but that, that's there's, exactly what they do. <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, this is like kind of the way that the Israelites are told to do war in the Holy Land is you, you are to eliminate everyone and take nothing. Correct, yeah. See, before there was a very much so like scavenger idea yeah. to it, like take what you can, we need to fight. But now they've made it. Now they're where they're supposed to be. So instead, their commandment is to, um, you don't need more because God will provide yep. for you. It's similar to the manna that they saw in the desert. God said, don't take more than what you need for the day because it will come tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But of course, people are still going to yes. take more than what they need. So anyway, ignoring that part, it's still the happy, cool wall about to fall down part. And it says, so the people shouted when the priest blew with the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man, woman, young and old, ox, sheep, ass, with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she hath as ye swear unto her. And the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she had. And they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. And they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein, only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and of iron, they put in the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household and all that she had, and she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day, because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. And Joshua adjured them at the time, saying, Cursed be to the man before the Lord that riseth up and buildeth this city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and in his youngest son shall he set up the gates of it. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all the country. So <clears throat> the people yell and it says the walls fell down flat, which if you're one of the people in Jericho, you've watched these people circle you seven days straight mm -hmm. and then they yell and these walls who have been there for who knows how long, just all at once. No longer than 1800 years, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, just 1800 years. <laughs> <laughs> just walls that have been there that long and they yell and they all fall over. And so yep. the people just destroyed everything, went through, took it and... All was destroyed except for Rahab and those who decided to trust her and be in her house, which is, again, another symbol of death being passed over because yeah. of the scarlet cord, so to speak. Um, and, yeah, and we're going to leave it there because the the, the next chapter, More immediately, it immediately starts with, it turns out, people stole money and gold for themselves. The, the people who just watched God, they screamed and God tore down a city, and they're yeah. like, I better get some gold. <laughs> um but so there's always there's, there's always someone there's always gonna someone idiot. there's always someone who's <laughs> going to be an idiot but um leaving it there to be nice yeah <laughs> jo uh, it was joshua's first time fighting their first time fighting in jericho and as he did what god said god destroyed the walls and rahab and her people were saved yep. um and i think that's pretty neat <laughs> without getting into the part it's... where the people steal all of the money and yeah. try to make it a big problem yeah yeah i mean it's a lot of these stories from this point on do become God, like God giving people reason to trust him and people continuing to be people, mm -hmm. uh, displaying the many faults of man and all of that. And there, there's a reason that you get to a point where there's a prophecy about the guy who's going to come and put us into a state of grace. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I, 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 like I said, I think one of the beauties of this is that idea that Rahab, and not just Rahab, yeah. but all those who trusted in the God of Israel, so to speak, all those who trusted in her, uh, were able to endure. Um, and it's, it's, again, another testament of God's providing hand throughout. 
not not only his providing him another picture of salvation mm -hmm. before Christ ever came along. Um, I think it's a beautiful thing. I agree. So yeah, we've, th we, we've covered it. We did. Yeah, we there did. we go. There's that. That's we, that. You got to hear about the the spies, the circumcision, the Michael threatening part, and also the Church of Ethiopia. So I think we did good amount of topics. That was a good amount of topics. <laughs> See, we stay in the fall of Jericho, and then we cover like. Right. Well, they should be used to that. <laughs> a college course worth material. Yeah. What that means, however, is that it is about a quarter after eight. So I think we'll take 15, 20 minutes and answer qu yeah. super chats, answer questions. Super chats, question time. And uh, then we have to film more things. Then we have to film more things for a video that will be up on my channel. Yes. Yes. So let me Absolutely. pull up the super chats. People are just spamming the Gord. You know what? It's the Gord of the Lord. The Gord of the <laughs> the faith in the gourd of the Lord. Have faith in the gourd. Oh, you can just pull up supers like this? Yeah. Whoa. We started doing this after, because uh, they, they just disappear after a while. Mm -hmm. So, All right. Starting with uh, with Reynold Hughes here. He said, I can't hang tonight, but I'm here to show my support. New cameras for the Lore Lodge boys. We are working on new cameras. <laughs> that is going to be a thing. <laughs> Let's see, uh, so thank you, Ray. Uh, Rock and Ruin said, from this day forward, I will refer to Irish Aiden. That's both of us, by the way, but I assume you mean Thornberry. Um, we're both uh -huh. Irish. As Nigel Strawberry, fair enough. I don't care. I may be 30, but a, I'm a rug rat at heart and refuse to grow up. Smash it. Uh, Jackman said, I got a Mason meeting tonight, so I can't stick around. Have fun, guys. That's when I made the joke about Yeah, the that's when you made the joke about the goat. Um, you know, uh, a little... We do our meetings on Wednesday. Um, <laughs> but Zach Millen said this podcast and the Wendy Daddy's religious videos. Wow, that's a the mouthful. The sentence have helped me convert to the back to the faith after years of agnosticism. The only question I have is what tips do you all have on deciding a dom denomination slash church? Thanks and keep it up. Oh, that means that means Thank the you. world. That means the world. Hear that. Yeah, uh, uh, I would say the primary thing to look for with any church is, and I. I'm safe to argue this with people. Uh, what's inside of this book is the holy and perfect word of God. And if anyone tries to alter or change it, that's not good. Yeah. So the closer they stick to this and not mo like modern. and the, 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 There's some churches who will use this as a backbone to talk about, oh, well, modern opinions and ideas mm -hmm. and whatever. The closer they are to the book, the closer they are to the faith. So... I would say that denominations, all that, that there can be differentiation down to personal yeah. preference, whatever. Uh, find something that sticks to the book. So I'm a Methodist and we stick to the book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, what he said. <laughs> but the, the, I mean, for me, that, that is my answer. I mean, that's how I ended up with Methodism is uh, the Wesleyan method, which is what Methodism is uh, predicated upon is the idea that you study the book and the book is the ultimate authority that if tradition and dogma and doctrine uh, contradicts the Bible, you take the Bible over the dogma right, in every right. single case, um, regardless of what the tradition says. Uh, there are people who disagree with that. I am one of those people who thinks that, you know, you need to back up your, your dogma with scripture. And if you can't, then... You know, that's a problem. Then that's a problem. That's not to say that Catholics and Orthodox, like, that, that's not Christianity. It is. The, all the other Protestant denominations are Christianity. I, I have no problem with that. It's just for me personally, I prefer the, the Methodist way of looking at things. Um, also, I'm, I have the uh, ch I have the regular chat pulled up on my phone if anyone has yeah, questions. Okay, cool. answers, so. okay uh, History Daddy for two pounds said, hashtag Maiden Mattis and hashtag Wenda Daddy making NNN hard. Just keep Ryan, going. I'm going to fly to England and hurt you. <laughs> Do not give him attention. <laughs> uh, French Sauce said, I hope y'all are having a fine afternoon. My question is, what are y'all's opinion on the levels of consciousness? It's a very vague question. Um, They're pretty cool. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. If, if you mean the idea that you can achieve different levels of consciousness... Um, you know, I, th I think that I, I wouldn't necessarily perceive consciousness mm. as, as, you know, tiered or leveled, but rather like, you know, I, I think you can close yourself off to perceiving certain things mm. and that as you, you know, broaden your mind, you can 
perceive more and more of the world around you and that you know narrow-mindedness is often a way to uh protect your psyche from things that you're not ready to understand or that trouble you and that you know as you as you open yourself up to new information new material new understanding you know that that will make you a more conscious person mm -hmm. if that makes sense that's my thoughts on it i guess i don't know if you have any uh not particularly the other korean i didn't know there were only two um said you spoil us with these weird bible podcasts thank you so much as socal floods i want to ask who's the biggest giga chad in the old testament i didn't know that socal was flooding um josh was in the in the running, running. i would s elijah i still have to say elijah i would also put daniel up there for the daniel moment where he there. walks into the feast and is like you really like that yeah and he's just <laughs> like uh you have been you have been uh numbered you have been perceived and you've been found wanting you're all going to die mm -hmm. and belshazzar is like you you are a prince now and he's like okay Sure, the like, kingdom that's gonna guy, be here this, for this is a guy four hours. Yeah. yeah, they're like, we're we're gonna throw you into a pit with lions, and he's like, do it, <laughs> see what happens. I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, Daniel's pretty cool. Yeah, Daniel's a cool one. I like him. Um, he also did a lot of the prophecy that leads to the existence of Revelation. Which yeah, is pretty cool. Uh, the gourd said, "Please do not cry for me. Weep not for the gourd." Uh, for those who weren't here last night, the gourd things come comes from uh, Jonah four nine um god as jonah is sitting there waiting for the city of nineveh to be destroyed because he thinks it's going to be destroyed despite the fact that god sent him there to preach and the king of nineveh was like you know what you're right and jo jonah got exactly what he wanted mm -hmm. jonah's just so you know filled with rage <laughs> he sits there and god gives him a gourd to to keep him out of the sun and Jonah just doesn't get the message, so God kills the gourd, and Jonah's like, my gourd. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> uh -huh. Kid Flash Clone said, watching from Duke Divinity School, I hope, uh, thank you, and I, I hope that we uh, did not contradict your professors. And if we did, um, that's kind of funny. Uh, um, RF907 said, watching while eating nachos and sipping Red Bull and vodka. That's, you know what? That is one way to do this. I, I, I appreciate that. It's a hell of an evening. Um, Born Confused said, Hello from Japan. I can't stay to watch the stream because I'm at work. I often miss them. I'll look for it to be uploaded. Thank you for what you do. Well, thank you for watching what we do. We appreciate it. Uh, Tony Vocal Squirrel Punk something says, They should have had Chris put up the walls. Then Israelites would have had to tap out. Chris? Do you, do you know what that's referencing? I have no idea. I don't. Um, Billy Bob Jr. says, love what you guys do. Really help me explore my faith. And he also said, what do you think of the books of Judas and Enoch? Judas, as far as I'm aware, is definitely much later and fraudulent. Right? Uh, the book of Judas, to my understanding, is... I haven't read it. Uh, from my understanding, it is a account that was written by an early catholic bishop yeah it's not first century like the rest no. of the gospels it was written post yeah. which is the reason it's not really like someone just wrote it later yeah. it wasn't divinely inspired i don't believe the entirety of the new testament of the bible the canon new testament of the bible was written in the first century AD. oh uh, people are informing me that chris jericho is a wrestler oh uh, okay, i don't no, watch wrestling. So, me yeah, neither continue uh, but i get the joke now yeah. it is a good joke it's if you know the joke, context yeah. <laughs> But yeah, uh, Enoch, on the other hand, my, my opinion of Enoch is that the version we have is a highly exaggerated version of the original because the version we have is a translation of the Ethiopic version, which is a translation of the Greek version, which is a translation of the original Hebrew. So some things get lost and modified in translation is my opinion on it. But I do think that it, originated as probably oral tradition passed down from the time of Enoch. Um, PJ Tab said, you guys are spectacular. Keep up the great work. I'm grateful for your teachings. You brought me close to my own faith. And with that, I am grateful. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That We're, that, that's it. what we do this for. Thank you. <laughs> um, the guy. 
the guy. The guy. The guy. Yeah. Is yeah. that from Spy Kids 3? Um, that, that the guy? Off topic, Wendigoon and I both fear the ocean. And thanks to the Lore Lodge, the fear of caves and forests is slowly growing within me. Love the channel, though. I appreciate that. And it gets worse. The more you learn, <laughs> it just gets worse. So. You still got the Great Plains. Yeah, but that's just like, it's spooky. <laughs> if it's not, if it doesn't have mountains, I don't want it. <laughs> um, and thank you for the donation. That means a lot. Uh, Dovin, 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 Dovin Doragon said, Bruh, I'd be afraid too if I knew an army of homeless people kept beating the neighboring nation's armies and were in my backyard too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's That's definitely, right. I wasn't saying that to imply that, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to get a cough guard. One of my friends just says, wife went into labor. So congrats. Oh. If you ever watch this, congratulations. Congratulations, <laughs> <I'm appreciated>. friend. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this happened during one of my Twitch streams. With really? One of my friends. Yeah. He's, he's sitting there on the on the mic and he's, he's like, what? Huh? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Guys, they're going to go to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, all right. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> um, do if I knew an army of homeless people. Yeah. So that, that, that took me out of it. I apologize. Yeah, it's fine. Um, yeah, like, I didn't say any of that to imply that, like, it would be dumb to be afraid. Like, there's a bunch of, like, people of no nation roaming the countryside, defeating every kingship that's been there for thousands of years. Yep. Horrifying. <laughs> it's a very Absolutely. scary prospect, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, Evan G, or uh, Nor Norberto, R I cannot speak tonight. Norberto Rodriguez Jr. said, I did not deserve the credit for Thomas. I was corrected. Also, keep up the Lord's work. It's okay. We all make mistakes. Sorry. I thought it was I James. I it. I went with the dog. He went along with Thomas. Yeah, I was like, sure, Thomas. Somebody sense. in the chat said it sounded like we didn't know what we were talking about, which hurt my feelings a little bit. Nah, but we all we all forget. Well, I wasn't things. I wasn't prepared, and I read yeah. about every one of the disciples at least once a week for Sunday school there's, or whatever. So there's I, twelve of them. You mix them up sometimes. Yeah, it's one there's of them. Peter and Paul are really the only easy yeah. ones. Yeah. <laughs> See, Evan G said, "Screw politics. Jesus and giants are all I need." It's the spirit. Honestly, I wish more people thought that way. <laughs> Gord, I'm in the arch. Incredible. We need Wendigord fan art. No, we don't. Keep going. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be funny. Uh, the Foxo Gaming said, if Joshua Graham was in the Bible, who would he be? Do you know who Joshua Graham is? All right, well, time to look up who Joshua Graham is. Not Josh Groban. One day you're going to do this, and it's going to pull up, like, the Orange website. Oh, the dude from uh, Fallout. Got New it. Vegas. He's a Mormon missionary. Yeah, he. Well, um, I've been baptized twice: once in water, once in flame. I will carry the fire of the Holy Spirit inside until I stand before my Lord for judgment. He'd probably be. He's he's very based. He'd probably be like Gideon. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. I agree with you. Um, let's go back to. I think you just have to refresh it, right? Sometimes, but this you know, once we get to a certain point, but this it's is fine. Easy enough. Oh. Um, there, there we go. go. There, here we go. Burrito Cat Twenty Three said, "According to leaders, the Ark of the Covenant is in Aksum at the Church of Saint Mary of Zion. That's Ethiopia. Um, that Aksum is is Ethiopia today. That's the ancient name for the, for the kingdom." Um. I don't think it is, but if it is, what would be the repercussions slash what would it mean for society now? Um, the I wouldn't Ark touch is it. lost after the fall of Jerusalem to Babylon in the 580s, if I remember correctly. It's, it's in Daniel is mm -hmm. when it gets lost. Um, there are a number of suggestions for where it ended up. One is that the Babylonians took it with them to Babylon. Right. Um, and that it was lost from there. One is that the Jews managed to escape with it and go southwest out of Babylonian territory. That, that would have taken away. them directly into Egyptian territory. Right. Or they might have taken it into into the sands of Arabia. I mean, the, the kingdom fell apart. There's a long period after that where it's kind of like people are in the ruins mm -hmm. of, uh, like, Israel, so to speak. So, Is there anything in Revelation about the Ark reappearing? Not to, my, so. not to my knowledge. Yeah, I don't it, remember. It was, it it was it. a important factor whenever God and the Holy Spirit worked physically on Earth. Yes. Uh, now they work spiritually. Yeah. So I don't think, like, obviously it's incredible. It'd be one of the most amazing, the arguably the most amazing yeah. historic find of all time if it was discovered. Um, and I think it'd be fantastic. And, you know, as a Christian, of course, you know, redeeming and fulfilling to see. 
but I don't think it holds the same power as the vessel of God because we yeah. don't need that anymore. We're the vessel of God. That's the whole point of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Uh, he doesn't have to come down and sit on the mercy seat. We are the mercy seat. Um, that being said, I don't, so I think, to my understanding, which I would be wrong, if it was found in the Old Testament, if you touched it, you died because you're like touching God directly. Um, I don't think that would still happen because the, because with the ripping of the temple, the Holy Spirit interacts spiritually with man rather than physically. So, yeah. I think if you were to find it, it would be far more important on a global geopolitical level than anything else. Probably. It would be more important for the study of history. It would confirm a lot of stuff about the Old Testament, mm -hmm. especially if the Ten Commandments are still in there. Um, like, I, did, I didn't even think about yeah, that. Like, if the tablets are still in there, that would be pretty huge. Moses' staff still yeah. in there? So if all, if all that was in there, it would be pretty massive i 100 percent think there would be a lot of killing over it there there would uh, the i would probably the christian i would and, probably kill over it the christian and islamic worlds would likely immediately go to war uh yeah. um it would not I'd, be pretty. I'd, I'd be down to shoot someone over yeah the uh, I'd just, <laughs> <laughs> which i understand hypocrisy because it says don't kill yeah, on it, it I, I think you'd probably end up in a situation where it would be uh the I think if it were discovered, if if uh, an Islamic country didn't get to it first, because I don't think I, with the current way that Christianity is in the West, it's has very little institutional power. There's a lot of cultural power, but very little institutional power. There are a lot of Islamic countries, like theocracies. Right. I think it would probably, if it was discovered and it was confirmed to be the real thing, you would probably see it spirited away in the night by either a country like uh, Saudi Arabia or Israel. Or um, us, if we're fast enough. You and me specifically? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I would charter a black on this water. <laughs> me and over there. Yeah. All right. Uh, Plaz said, Wendigoon slash Mattis P.O. Box has got stuff for y'all. I don't know if you have one. I do not have one. Um... I'm getting a new one soon because I moved. So I will have a new one soon. If you want to send anything to him, send it to me and I'll send it to him. Yeah, that's a, like that's, that's probably a great the best idea way to, to say it on the internet. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Tell people if they want to prank me that they have to prank you first. Exactly. That's, yeah. <laughs> send it to this guy. <laughs> Whatever is visited upon you will be visited upon me first. <laughs> Actually, that's very basic of you. Thank yeah. you. That's very kind. I'm like your uh, your food taster. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, Adjusted Brass says, hey guys, love what y'all do. Fantastic work. Could you guys shout out my girlfriend, Casey? She's pretty great and loves your stuff. P.S. When to Gord merch when? <laughs> um, well, hi, Casey. Hi, Casey. <laughs> <laughs> they, I'm very glad that you like our stuff. Yes. It means the world. I appreciate it. Thank you for watching. Congratulations on dating this fine man, Adjusted Brass. Assuming a he's a man. Yeah. If not, then congratulations on dating this fine not man, Adjusted Brass. Correct. Uh, <laughs> the two genders, man, not man. Yeah, yes, there you go. Um, technically not incorrect. <laughs> uh, Catherine Parnell says, "I uh, do. Do you plan on doing any Wendigoon merch anytime soon? I don't think you said probably not. Because if I do, if I do a merch, it'll be a limited drop through a company that I have nothing to do with. <laughs> <laughs> like God, I feel that. Yeah. Um, if Isaiah opens a PO box, I will unironically make a Wendigord fan art and mail it to him." <laughs> That means the world as pre man. I keep yawning. It's sneaky time. Um, <laughs> Somebody could take your one of your U2s and put a pumpkin on it. That would be pretty. Funny. Would be a Wendigord. Uh, that would be a Wendigord. I'll say uh, what he said. If I, I greatly appreciate that. If that is something you want to do, send it to this guy, and it'll find its way to yep. me eventually. Eventually. Uh, Sun Wukong said thoughts on Hebrews ten twenty six. I know Catholics use this verse to justify the idea of penance, but in my Methodist church, I was always taught that as long as you accept Jesus and repent, your sin is forgiven. Uh, let me look I, up. No, I actually have that pulled up because I was I saw that earlier. Oh, okay. You were just you were just prepped. Yeah. No, I I just opened my Bible and it landed. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I was prepped. It says uh, the Bible of the wall. The, so Hebrews ten twenty six says, "For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins." So if we sin willfully, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. It's so I, I, I mean I don't see how that would I don't see how it goes to penance. justify uh, yeah I don't see how that goes to I don't penance. see how it goes to 
needing to to me it kind of confirms the opposite yeah actually. i think it's pretty cut and dry that it's saying that if you sin because there's this idea that a bunch of people in the early church have like okay if i know sin's bad and i commit sin do, do i not get into heaven yeah uh, which is not what christ no. said at all uh what he's saying here is is that if we sin willfully there remaineth no more sacrifice we don't we there's don't no need, further sacrifice there's no further sacrifice yeah. it's not good he continues to elaborate immediately after that it says but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries he that despised moses's law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall be thought worthy who hath trodden under the foot of the son of god and hath counted the blood hebrews is yeah. very poetic yeah. the short version of what he's saying is like there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. You don't have to sacrifice or do anything further. Yeah. But sins often have bad consequences. And we saw that people who disobeyed Moses' law suffered the consequences, fiery indignation, as it says. Yeah. So you are subject to consequences if you commit sins. But as you said, there is no more yeah, there's sacrifice no more... needed for sins. Yeah, I agree with you on that. And I, th I think your Methodist uh, pastor is correct. That, yes. Yeah, it's you, you should be cognizant of sin. You should avoid it. And if you do end up falling into it, then repentance is repentance good if you want to good. stay in the will of God yes. and to receive his blessings. It doesn't mean you're going to hell if you do something wrong. Uh, to, if to, that was the case, yeah. then no one in the Bible would have ever gotten into heaven. <laughs> to, to give an example of another another passage, um, the if you deny me in front of your friends and I will deny you before my father. Right. That's not... Christ saying you're you're not getting into heaven you're being right. taken out of the book of life it's basically saying we're no longer intervening on your behalf yeah yeah so it talks about Christ makes intercession between God and yeah. man it's like you can't if you deny Christ and like stay away from him your whole life uh don't be surprised whenever you don't get everything you want or the blessings yeah. God had intended for you as a Christian it doesn't mean you lose your salvation it just means that intercept you are cutting off that intercession because you're not choosing to take part in Christ exactly uh, he's created the world and wants to give you blessings who are you to tell him that you're not interested yeah <laughs> you know sorry don't like yeah it, it, it's the idea of like you know God wants to give you all this stuff and you're like eh, but that what if my friends think it's cringe like okay have fun not getting those yeah, then. exactly um joshua stevens said uh what are your thoughts you on you oh, what, your point. Oh, yes that's that was one okay, of yeah, sorry. Apologies. josh stevens said what are your thoughts on reincarnation the accounts of that girl with the memories i don't remember her name does this fit biblically or is it just not possible what? thoughts on re that girl with the memories i i'm assuming he's talking about someone who supposedly had memories i've heard past life of yeah people have memories of past life and stuff. um I mean, personally, I've never once had a memory of a past life. I've seen, I've had, I've had dreams of things that eventually happened. Yeah, weird, like deja vu. Yeah, like shot. where I'm like, I, there was one when Aiden and I got here. I think mm -hmm. I told you, like, I was like, hang on. That's just because you dream of me a lot. Yeah, you know how it is. Um, <laughs> but no, uh, I would argue that reincarnation is pretty certainly unbiblical. Um, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. It just doesn't. It doesn't fit. No, I don't vibe with it. Um, when, it it's pretty clear that when that, you die, I, that, you are I reunited think, with God, I, I, or you are cast away from Him. I unironically, assuming people aren't lying, think it's or misremembering or misstating whatever. Think it is more likely that there is some secret way that consciousness can be explored by other consciousnesses, mm -hmm. and that time exists as a fourth dimension that we sometimes trip out of. Yeah. Before I believe in reincarnation. Yeah. I'm I am much more likely to believe in dimensional slips yes, than correct. reincarnation. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, Norberto Rodriguez Jr. says, "Who was the worst person or people in the Bible?" I, uh, I mean, Pharaoh was pretty bad. He's not great. Um, the worst? Judas would be up there. I, I mean, I yeah, but J Judas. J J I actually don't. Kayla just Kayla just said Pilate. I, I don't fault Pilate. I mean, I fault him. As, as a Christian, I do, but like as a historian, he he kind of did what. Yeah, yeah, he did, he did what was his job, but the Bible later faults him yeah. directly. It says, Pilate, the blood, it says the washing did not remove the blood yeah. from his hands. But, like, he was still faulted, but I don't know if I'd call yeah. him the most evil. Yeah, that's what I mean. Is when that... I think of uh, Ahab, potentially, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, they're for, up there. For what reason? Uh, 
beheading thousands of prophets. Yeah, that fits. Yeah. Yeah. I was just curious exactly where yeah, you're going yeah, with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Delilah was just some tramp who was trying <laughs> to kill the guy who kept ripping people in half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Samson was a menace. He was going through to to them, like you know the uh, what were they? Uh, Philistines. Philistines. Yeah. Like he was just going through the Philistines, killing thousands of them at a time. And she was just seduced him, and he fell mm-hmm. for it. She's conniving, but I wouldn't call her the most evil. I think King Ahab and Queen Jezebel they killed thousands and thousands, and would spill their blood over their families' houses mm-hmm. and stuff. Jezebel was eventually eaten by a dog. Yeah, Jezebel And the, rough. <laughs> the prophet who was there and killed her said, this is too good for her. being eaten alive by dogs. Um, so, I, yeah, probably those two. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's any... I mean, other than, like, the devil, but that doesn't count. Um, yeah. I, you I got Jezebel. A... Huh? Oh, that's a yeah. He was pretty wicked. He didn't kill that many, but he was pretty awful. The one who uh, tried to kill Esther, Mordecai, was yeah. tried to hang Haman. Hmm. Haman, yeah, Haman was pretty bad. Yeah, everyone in Sodom and Gomorrah, apparently. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> everyone uh, but Lot. I'm There's still, a I'm, lot of bad. I'm people. still sticking to Ahab. And yeah, Jezebel. that's fair. Oh, that's oh, fair. oh, 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 Herod. Oh yeah, Herod's. But pretty he didn't really different. do anything different than Pharaoh. What do you mean he did anything different than Pharaoh? What are you talking about? He did the same thing. Which Pharaoh are you? You're talking about I'm the talking other about Renetta, yeah. You're talking about the one who had the children. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, he and Herod and okay. Pharaoh. Okay, Herod also did that, what? but then Herod also went around executing prophets. And oh, it was okay, Herod's so daughter who he was into. Because yeah. remember it says his daughter danced in front of him and he mm-hmm. liked her. Yeah. Uh, and she was like, I want the head of John the Baptist. So he had John the Baptist executed. Gotcha. I see your point. And he had his head mounted on a silver platter, which is where the term comes from, head on a silver platter. I did not know that's where that's that where came comes from. from. Because her daughter wanted his head mounted on that. So Herod's up there too. His entire... Herod's actually, daughter would also be... <laughs> Herod's daughter's also up there, but she, she was as wicked as he is. Um, Herod was so evil. You know how there's the uh, the covenant over the any king of Israel? Mm-hmm. That uh, anyone who's a leader of Israel, they essentially get some leeway. God mm-hmm. says he blesses leaders. Mm-hmm. That if a leader does something wrong, it doesn't mean immediately strike down, you lose your throne. Yeah. Saul's an example yeah. of that. He was the Lord's anointed, so he was given favor. Okay, Herod, I could be wrong. To my knowledge, well, Ahab... Those two were the only ones who were so bad they lost their anointing. God, gotcha. God. because uh, the way Herod died is he was having his people give a speech, or he was giving a speech in front of the people, and he stood up and said, "I am now as great as God. Mm-hmm. I am your God, not the Lord Jehovah." Mm-hmm. And it says as soon as he said that, an angel came down and smote him with the sword. <laughs> So that's pretty bad if you like yeah. get the ire that bad. John Lennon said something similar. How'd that go for him? He got shot. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate I it. I don't like the Beatles. Thank you for inher- for comparing King Herod to John Lennon. I really don't like John Lennon. Just keep going through the <laughs> chips. Uh, the Legend 27 said, Sil- uh, since, not silence, since you're both polite and rational people and talked about the Bible being the last word, I wanted to mention Jehovah's Witnesses. They get a bad rap, but also follow the Bible first. Thoughts? Um... So the whole doctrine of the elect thing bugs me. I don't know why you would go around uh, preaching the gospel to people only to tell them, oh, by the way, uh, if you follow this, it doesn't really matter because God already picked 144,000 people to go to heaven and you may or may not be one of them and nothing you do can help. So I don't love that that as a theological concept. Uh, I don't know what about you. Um, the, uh, nothing particularly against them. It's just the same way I feel about any other doctrine, Christian yeah. uh, or other. Well, I guess the only ones I could have the conversation with about it are Christian doctrines, so like mm-hmm. any other belief system that professes Christ. If the Bible is the complete and perfect Word of God, why do you need more? Yeah, that's that's the way I feel about all of it. It's kind of it's similar to how to like Mormonism. It's it's not that I necessarily dislike. That I don't just like. Yeah, them I, don't, I don't have problems with them as people at all. Like the, it's yeah. as, as long as you believe in Christ crucified, we can get along. Yeah, that's all that matters. Uh, Christ, Son of God, crucified and resurrected. That's that's my barrier yeah. for entry. 
Uh, but like if to to someone who agrees on that with me, a brother in Christ, brother or sister in Christ, I would ask, okay, why was that not enough? <laughs> like, yeah. like why did someone come along later and that is equatable to it? You know, yeah. like sure, I'll listen to pastors and men of God who like give opinions or commentary. That's completely different. That doesn't mean I absorb their teachings into my belief system. Yeah. You know, I I, I think I think this was pretty definitive and did a, a good enough job. Good yeah. enough, a perfect job. <laughs> Sorry, I should have rewarded that. Just because I've seen it a million times, Phaser Blade has been asking, uh, if the global flood killed everything, how do we end up with regional species and humans on remote islands such as Sentinel Islands? Um, very difficult to answer that in enough time to make it just for the question and answer section. But uh, in the episode we did on Genesis, if I remember correctly, I don't think we've done an entire episode on the flood. Have we? We did. We didn't? Just I'm on the almost, flood? I'm almost positive. We spent like an hour on the flood. Yeah, we definitely... I, Close enough. If there's not a flood episode, then it's in the Genesis episode. Yes. So I would recommend you go watch that. Um, that's just... It's going to be able to explain it a lot better than we can in a few minutes. Uh, Hades D. Ace said, Hey, Wendigoon was watching the official podcast earlier and wanted to let you know that JoJo's has good Nazis and has parts of Jesus scattered around the USA. Also love your video on the Black Parade album, one of the best. Huh? What a what a thing to just drop on a chat full of unsuspecting <laughs> people. We were talking about JoJo's Bizarre Adventure okay. on the official podcast. And I uh, I was like, I've never seen the show. And they were trying to explain to me that there's like actual third rock Nazis in the show. Okay. But they're like, but then I think Charlie said, like, but Jesus is in there too. And I was like, what are you talking about? So he's, he's certainly a bizarre adventure. It is. And he's clarifying, like, no, it's just parts of it. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you Got for it. that. It's just parts of Jesus. I appreciate it. What a, what a horrific sentence out of context. <laughs> but he did say he loves your Black Parade video. Thank you. I'm very glad you liked that video. That's, I appreciate that. that is the first video of his that I ever watched. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when people started tagging me in your videos and tagging you in mine, I was really confused. I don't make Black Parade. I was like, what's yeah. this have to do with the Black Parade? Like, And I was like, <laughs> oh, he's doing other stuff now. Um. Okay. Uh, oh, boy. I think I scrolled too far. I definitely scrolled too far. Okay. The Gord said, gotta do Gord work. Thank you. Enjoyed your stream. Apologies for the chaos. God will smite me later. He did smite the Gord. He did smite the Gord, in fact. Well, thank you. Uh, I hope you... I, I wish you the best in your Gording zone. Um, the, Joshua Steven said, the Ark was found from what I heard, but most people that tried to pull it out died of cardiac arrest. You made me look it up sometime. I will look that up. It does not sound familiar. But I will look at in it. all of my paranoid research into the, the Ark of the Covenant, I haven't <laughs> seen that. Um, unless it's new, which it might be. It might just be information I haven't come across, but I'd be interested mm -hmm. in that. Yeah. yeah. Um, the One Templar said, I'm going to get married next year. I hope my first child is a girl so I can name her Wendy after you, Wendigoon. Aww. That, that means a lot, and I appreciate the sentiment. Please do not name a child after me. I am a small man <laughs> and do not need that kind of... He's not a small man. He's six one. Stop it. Um, <laughs> no, uh, that's, I'm glad you uh, appreciate the. Change. But her middle name has to be Goon. If then. if I was a girl and my parents named me Wendy Goon, I would change my last name. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Sun Wukong said, "How come God sent Jonah to Nineveh to save them when they sacrificed children?" From what I remember, but he just kind of nuked Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, God God was well certain that Sodom and Gomorrah were irredeemable. So uh, the fact of the matter is uh, he did send someone to save Sodom and Gomorrah. He sent Lot and then he also sent Abraham. He sent two, the two guys to the city to evangelize it. And both times it went horribly. It, yeah. uh, it corrupted Lot to the same level of depravity they were at. And Abraham could not find a single person in the city who was righteous or willing to hear anything out. And whenever the angel showed up, they tried to force themselves onto the angels. So that's yeah. the kind of people we're dealing about. Again, uh, Nineveh was also evil, but, but redeemable. They were willing to listen. That's why God said they do not know their right from their left. They're not inherently 
awful people, they they were untaught. Yeah. They're Whereas ignorant. Sodom and Gomorrah was inherently awful people. It's uh, the difference between ignorance and wrongdoing. Ignorance and evil. Yeah. yeah is the difference. Um, and he did try. He did make the case for them twice, and they rejected it both times. Let's see. Uh, werewolf Hours just gave us two dollars. Thank you. Thank you, Werewolf Hours. I appreciate you. Real Werewolf Hours. Uh, meow Meow said Muppet Flail of Joy. Muppet the, Flail of I think Joy? that's the Kermit gift. Oh, okay. Um, hey guys, so stoked to catch this. I have to ask VBS, Vacation Bible School, I assume. Did either of you grow up with that delightful summertime event? And also, uh, what are your thoughts on Alanis? Much Alanis. Love. Uh, for VBS, yes, I did do that. Did you? I did VBS and Alanis. I, I I enjoyed VBS. Uh, I had a good time. I fondly remember the uh, pizza bagels. Yes, the pizza bagels were good. The uh, you, Did you drink the bug juice stuff? We did not have bug juice. There's bug juice, and then there was the, uh, they look like barrels. We had those. Uh, yeah. We had the barrels. So you poke the hole in the top, and you drink the, the barrel. Yeah, the weird colored drink. Yeah, and there was, I have no idea what that stuff was. And then there's was like, like Kool-Aid-ish. Yeah, then there's like the giant Cheeto puffs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the good memories. I have good memories. I mean, you went, you hung out with other neighborhood kids, you did arts and crafts, you sang some songs. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. And Awana's was good too. Awana's was like a Wednesday night program we did at church. Okay, we didn't have that. Um, and what, it was a cool system because what they did is you got a little red vest uh -huh. and you had these little booklets that were Bible verse memorization. If you could go from one of the Awana leaders and like show them the verse and you were able to repeat it back, you got these little badges. Mm -hmm. And like you wore crowns, the badges looked like crowns, and every time you got it right, you could put a little jewel in the crown. Mm -hmm. So you could immediately tell how studied a kid was or studied <laughs> how much how many verses he yeah. could recite by how crowned his <laughs> jewels were and stuff. So it immediately became a competition. Like I have to be right. better than you. So in that competition, I had learned and to this day retained more biblical verses from that from that than anything That's else. So funny! Like when I was eight years old, I was like, I have to have more crowns to do now. I can still recite a ton of like Christ teachings. And it stuff, works. Which is, it worked. It was a fantastic program. I support <laughs> it. Yeah. Um, Disbanded Courier Games says, "What is your opinions on the realm Samuel is in in First Samuel twenty eight? Is it heaven, hell, something else?" He warns Saul that he will join him when he dies. I'm gonna have to look at it unless that is, that, yeah, out. that's when a uh, uh, whenever the, you know this verse. Whenever, I might, I might not. Whenever Saul goes to the Witch of Endor and tries to get her to summon the soul of Samuel. And anyway, so what happens is he goes to the Witch of Endor at night. Saul has her summon the spirit of Samuel. Samuel appears and says, "Why hast thou disturbed me?" And then says that Saul's gone too far. He's gonna die, and that he'll join him. So I think it's pretty clear that, again, we talked about this previously, demons and demonic entities have no power outside of God. He is the creator. They can just manipulate what God's already created. So there, God was allowing Samuel or allowing the spirit to connect through so that Saul could get his just deserves, so that he could get what he deserved in speaking in this manner. So whenever... Um, Samuel appears. It's not Samuel coming from some weird limbo universe, whatever. It's just the spirit of Samuel mm -hmm. warning Saul, which is something that happens a lot in the Bible. The spirits of the dead come back to talk to the living. He's coming back to tell Saul that he's in trouble and that when he meant you will join me tomorrow, he meant you'll be dead. Yeah. So I agree. With I, you. I don't think he I meant you'll join me in this. Again. Yeah, I don't think he meant you'll join me in this limbo stage. I think he just meant yeah. you will join me in death. The the Jewish delineation between heaven and as they call it show uh shale is not quite as concrete as the the christian version of things uh a lot of our perception of heaven and hell comes from um dante and paradise lost the bible itself is a lot less descriptive um you get a lot of simile a lot of allegory a lot of illusion you don't get a ton of like concrete this is what it is Christ never describes hell in any specific terms. It's just separation from God is what you get. Um, and then you get that it's as as fire. Like, it's as painful as that to be separate from God. Um, so I would argue Samuel's probably in heaven, but yeah, I agree with you that what he's saying is you're, you're going to die. Not, Join me in death. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Werewolf Hour says, I know you love the gourd, but any other favorite quotes? 
Uh, I mean, Philippians 4.13, obviously, is, is one of the, the go-tos. I can do all things through Christ. Yeah. Uh, Thessalonians 4, I think it's 4.12. Um, do not despise the coming of small things. Um, basically, what? What? It's the way the way I, I, I know that in it has a broader context, but I like I, I like just the line on its own in the sense that it means um it's it's saying do do okay. not what I, I thought i thought you were making a joke no i wasn't making a joke i'm serious okay. this is in my instagram bio it has been I'm for years sorry. i'm sorry um <laughs> i the, the way i'm reading it is you know don't don't be upset about something just because it's small you know take your victories as they come even if they're small victories even if it's a little goal that you've fulfilled Take that and be happy of it. Do not be upset because it wasn't as big as it could be. I just like that line, you know, the message that it sends out of context as well as the message it sends in context. What about you? I'm so sorry for that, by the way. I, <laughs> I thought you were setting me up. No, I was that. not. I uh, That's a good verse. I like it. Uh, my favorite is, um, well, one of them is we talked about before. I fought the good fight. Yeah. I, finished, I finished the course. I kept the faith. Therefore, laid out for me as a crown of righteousness. Yeah. Credit. yeah, that's from Ephesians 4, 6, I believe. Oh, and uh, what, what Stephen says as he's being killed is also up there. with. Yeah, the Steve, Stephen's also definitely one of those. Yeah. Uh, do not lay this on their account. Yeah, yeah, yeah incredible. Uh, but my favorite verse in the Bible has got to be Matthew 25, 40. Uh, the, so this is during one of Christ's messages, whenever he was talking to the men and he was trying to tell them the importance of what the work is. And... Um, he says, then shall the righteous, uh, yeah, let's start. He says, then shall the righteous answer him, talking about on the day of judgment, whenever they're talking to God. Mm -hmm. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we the, oh, sorry, I'm getting a little too ahead of myself. Um, Christ says to them, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the, from the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. Talking about in the end times whenever Christ brings all of the uh, Christians and the righteous together and says, Here uh, you are now given authority over the what was meant for you from the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. It says, for I, When I was hungered, you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick and ye visited me. I was in prison and ye came unto me. So, well, it continues, says, Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we when saw we thee hungered and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when we saw thee sick or in prison and came unto thee. So Christ is saying, Here you can have my you can have the kingdom. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was in prison, you came to me. When I was thirsty, mm -hmm. all the all these different messages. And the righteous, it says, they'll ask and say, "We never saw you, Christ, naked or hungry, clothed in prison, whatever." Like, what are you talking about? And my favorite verse in the Bible is verse forty, which says, "And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you." Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Mm -hmm. Which I think is not only the perfect call as a Christian, but the perfect call to live by. Yeah. Because Christ didn't say that you you went to people and you made sure that they believed everything the correct way. You didn't go to people and made sure, okay, well, if they feel this way about this and if they're nice people, you did. He's talking about naked, hungry prisoners, mm -hmm. like the society's outcast, right? Yep. Who everyone else will look on. He said, whenever you do something for them, you're doing it. You're not doing it for me. You're doing it to me. Right. Which is, I think, one of the most incredible calls of a yeah, Christian. Yeah, I agree with you on that. So, yeah. Matthew 25, 40 is pretty powerful. That's a good one. And it's a really easy one to live by, too. Yeah. As simple as you pass a homeless person on the street, you buy him a sandwich. Yeah. Like, you have done it unto me. Um, you know, those those are the works that they're talking about. It's not, you don't have to be going above and beyond. It's the little... Yeah, stuff. yeah. Pe people get so caught up on, like, the definition of works and stuff. It's really not... It, it can... It's really not that difficult. <clears throat> Good. I was about burp and I caught it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, Domi Potato said, thanks for doing this. You guys got me so much more interested in the Bible than I've ever been. 
I was in Christian school for nine years. The Holy Spirit works through men such as you. Thanks. Thank you. That means a lot. That's that was incredibly sweet. That's I very appreciate that. Thank you. Um, let's see. Short Mason meeting. We found a new piece of Eden. Was that an Assassin's Creed reference? I think that was an Assassin's, Assassin's Creed Assassin's reference. Creed reference. Um, and yeah, if you're back already, that was a short meeting. I'm jealous. Jeez, ours <laughs> like we walk in that room at like seven, and I don't leave until ten something. I gotta find the goat, and then I gotta drag it. <laughs> That's part of the fun, you know. We release the goat into the room, and you have to catch it, but it's all greased up, like <laughs> you know. And then you actually, we don't get a knife or anything. Like whoever catches it actually has to box the goat to death. You know, it's. Right, which is especially hard when it starts speaking in Latin. Yeah, and the goat starts speaking in tongues, and you start levitating. It's yeah. a it's a whole mess. <laughs> uh, Sun Wukong said, "Thank you guys for answering my questions. I was wondering what is the exact kind of Bible Wendigoon has. I know it's KJV, but what kind? What's I guess what's the uh... oh uh, well this kind specifically is just a study Bible that uh, a my dad actually gave to me a while back. It is the KJV study Bible. Uh, it's by Barber Bibles. This one is." Uh, but I use all kinds of King James Bibles, different translations. My favorite is the, well, one of my favorites is the Salem Kerbin Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Salem Kerbin was put together by, also I should clarify for those who don't know, there's different translations, which is like the the actual Bible, the part you read. Yeah. Uh, the different prints or different styles that I'm talking about is like, there'll be these little footnotes or like yeah. little study glossaries that help at the bottom that's the different editions of the yeah. same translation so it's all king james version but the salem Kerbin, like as you're reading it uh it will like draw lines from verses and then show you how that relates to like prophecies and revelations how it relates to themes mentioned previously back yeah. it's honestly a bible that you could if you wanted to read through the bible while working your way through these through lines of thoughts of like concepts of God and salvation and all that, you could just using the glossary. It's pretty yeah. cool. Um, I, I use a Ryrie KJV as my study Bible. Um, I really like it for a lot of the same reasons you like yours. It's got, it's got great footnotes. I will warn you if, and it has maps. That's a big reason I like the Ryrie is maps the maps. Cool. It's got maps. It's got chronologies. It's, it's got tables. Like it's a very well done study Bible. I will warn people the timing is wrong, in my opinion. Um, it places Exodus around 1500 BC. I place Exodus closer to 1200. Um, if we're getting super specific, I place it around uh, like the actual leaving Egypt around March of uh, 1206 BC. Um, based on a solar eclipse that occurred in 1207, and then the fact that the first Passover happens after that, and that eclipse was in October of 1207, so mm -hmm. um, it, it goes ahead. That's my my dating for it. So, uh, you know, take it as you will. But aside from the the dating stuff, the rivalry is fantastic in my opinion. Um, Pedro Alatore says, "Greetings from San Diego, California. I was raised Roman Catholic. What is the difference between Christianity and Roman Catholicism?" Uh, Christianity, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, other sects. So uh, Christianity is the umbrella term, then the specific tradition you follow, it falls under that. So uh, Roman Catholicism is very similar to the Eastern Orthodoxy, as well as certain Protestant sects like Lutheranism and Anglicanism. Uh, it gets really granular on what the theological differences are. Most of the differences between these church groups stem from earthly politics more than they do from theological differences. There are certain ones like the Filioque, which is uh, the belief that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son versus the belief that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son proceeds from the Father. Uh, basically, the Holy Spirit is both Christ and God, and one is the Holy Spirit is just God, not Christ. And then, of course, all three of them are the same thing. The, the Trinity is one of the most difficult things to explain to anybody, and one of the most difficult things to possibly wrap your head around. Uh, you know, the idea that God is whole, Jesus is holy God and holy man, still the Son of God. It, I have yet to find a good, simple way to explain it to somebody that doesn't take me three hours, so... The Trinity? Yeah. Because um, there's the very simple way of explaining it, and if mm -hmm. somebody accepts that, cool. 
but then when people are like, well, how does this work? And what about that? And how does this translate to this? It, it, you end up answering so many questions. They, they are each, all three are one God, but are each in themselves holy God as well. Yeah. So, yeah. And do you believe all three have existed since the dawn of time or that God split himself? Uh, I think they've all existed. I think that time is a, uh, I'm nearly positive that with the way the, Bible describes God and eternity and all that, that time is for yeah. us on earth right now. Gotcha. Um, PJ Tab said, can we get the story of Cain and Abel? Uh, we do have the story of Cain and Abel in the Genesis, the, in the beginning. Do, yes. Um, it's not the first episode. I think it's the third, but if you go it's through, like if that. you go through the playlist, the weird Bible playlist, uh, it'll we, be in we, there. We have talked about Cain and Abel. Yeah, we have <laughs> definitely talked about Cain and Abel. Um, See, uh, favorite Prince of Egypt track. I'd have to go back and re-listen to it. It's been so long. You that I call brother. Whatever song that was. <laughs> yeah. uh, Charles Ware the Fourth says, finally been trying for months to catch you all live. Been wanting to ask, do y'all believe in the young earth? Love the show. Keep up. Good work. I think that falls somewhat into the time thing you just said. but I think what he's talking about, young earth, which is, I guess, the philosophy. The 6,000 years thing. The 6,000 years, but yet, yes, the earth the pieces of it being naturally created would be older than that, but the earth and the universe was made for our wonderment. So there's nothing to say that God didn't just make it in its current stage. Yeah. And it's, yeah, I guess I, if that's what he's talking about. Yeah. I think yeah. that is what he's asking. I, I take that first uh, six days in Genesis and I do not perceive those as 24 hour days. To me, those are a um, separation marker in my opinion. That it's the, the first day is the first stage of creation, so to speak, and that uh, those could have taken place over however many millions or billions of years. Or, of course, there's the time dilation that occurs near, near, near gravitational wells. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I mean, I, I don't totally understand astrophysics, so I can't explain it super well on that account. But when I when I read it, I don't read it as those six days of creation or 24 hour days. I'm looking at that as this could be any number. This could be any span of time. It, it begins with the beginning of time so i also hope you don't think i'm just looking no at no i know you're looking at the, okay. you're looking at chat i am um oh boy sometimes it just like scrolls for me uh pedro alatore says i tried going to church a few times but didn't like the singing there are churches that don't sing at all i like listening to the stories and learning about the bible what books podcasts do you recommend to read listen to uh to learn about roman catholics uh in roman catholicism the more you learn about it, the less you're going to like it, to be perfectly honest, in my opinion. Uh, there's a lot uh, There's a lot of history that is not... Uh, they, a lot of their dogma comes out of medieval politics and times that they needed to uh, get certain things for purposes of worldly security rather than spiritual security. Things like the uh, Donation of Constantine... Um, like the investiture controversy, the iconoclast controversy, just a whole bunch of things like that. But uh, as far as as far as podcasts for learning about the Bible go, other than this one, um, other than this one, I'm trying to think uh, who who I've listened to in the past. I mean, Frank Turek's a great a great speaker. Uh, if you want to listen to just people talk about Christianity, um, do you have anybody that comes to mind? I'll be honest, I don't listen to a lot of biblical stuff outside of sermons, of course, Same. and pastor friends that I have who just like hand me a CD. Yeah. <laughs> like they're not they're not quite with hip with the time, so to speak. A CD. Yeah. I I'm trying to think if there's uh anyone off the top of my head, but I, I really my, um Uh, ooh, uh, I don't know where I was going with this. But like, there's yeah. one guy on TikTok who does a really good job, who's Catholic, uh, Thomas Wilcom. I disagree with him, but I think he has a podcast, if I remember correctly. Um, another one would be Inspiring Philosophy here on YouTube. Uh, I don't know his exact orient, uh, his exact like sectarian orientation, but I had him on the Lore Lodge, and he was fantastic. Uh, very well versed, very intelligent. I have some theological disagreements with him, but. He was very good. Um, I think he would be a good place to start. Uh, he's also funny. Like, he's got a great attitude. Let's 
see. Uh, Pedro Alatore said, love the podcast. Also, thank you all so much. We're still 450 followers this long. Yeah, like, question. you guys That's are really awesome. cool. Like, thank you all. Appreciate it's fantastic. I uh, love the podcast. Listen to work like always tomorrow. Thanks for making me able to talk to my grandma and mother-in-law about the Bible. Oh, okay. Happy to help. Sweet. Thank you. Very kind. <laughs> Josh Parrish said, have you heard of the Urantia book? It's wild. Do you? Uh, that might as well be gibberish to me. Uh, what, what, what was it? How was it spelled? Urantia. Let me look it up and see. Uh... <laughs> the Urantia book. Spiritual philosophical book that originated in Chicago sometime, sometime between 1924 and 1955. Nobody knows who wrote it. I I will take a look at it. I've never uh, 2,000 pages. Good Lord. I will see what I can do about, you know. Yeah, you should be able to cover it. this in a night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um. Ah, at part four, it gets into the life and teachings of Jesus. Got it. I'll have to look into it. Um, but that is a good question. Uh, we got into the spirit science stuff at one point on Twitch, so that would be the same idea, I guess. Um, I think this should be the last one. Uh... Isai Oviedo said, would love to hear an episode on the harrowing of hell or on Melchel Mel Melchizedek. I'm a pastor and Sunday school teacher in a Miami church. Love this podcast. Well, thank you. That's, uh, that's cool to have peers watching. Yes, very, yeah. very cool. I appreciate it. I'm also a Sunday school teacher, so that means a lot. Glad that you're listening. Uh, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, Melchizedek's an interesting one to go down the rabbit hole of. Um, fun fact, I actually met a man who I was delusional. Uh, who told me that he was a priest of the Melchizedek order? He thought yeah. that he was the uh, uh, the reincarnation of Moses. Ah, that was fun. Good. So that that was actually before I knew what Melchizedek was too. So that was my introduction to him. Like he made that up, but he didn't. <laughs> that was years back, like in high school, before yeah. I like got into like studying the Bible. Uh, Melchizedek's interesting. The idea that it's this lineage of priest and this. Uh, idea kind of as these watchers who like uh kept israel in line up until Christ. oh, oh trust I, me i've 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 gone down the melchizedek rabbit hole. oh okay all right yeah <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, it's very the, a lot of the spirit science stuff yeah is is rooted in in the melchizedek, melchizedek work, and yeah. all that uh we will almost definitely talk Touch about it, it yeah. at some point uh, in heaven and hell we'll also almost yeah. definitely talk We've about got an entire episode more. on he on uh on hell we do, yeah. We so talked about that's, that for a long time. Yeah. I, I think we'll definitely get... The, there will be a point at which, once we've gotten through all the books of the Bible, we will get to a point where we start talking Topical. about, you know, later theology, so to speak, yeah, yeah. and, you know, how it falls in and falls out and all that. Um, yeah, respectfully, yeah. of course, we'll avoid making fun of anybody beyond, like, factual, beyond, beyond you historical calling stuff. the Roman Catholics illegitimate. I didn't call them illegitimate. I said illegitimate. that they made some choices. Uh-huh. I didn't love. Jess Finch asked, what are your thoughts on Goth? Uh, one threw a chair at me once. Thank you. Uh, I don't believe in ghosts as in like wayward souls, like souls of humanity. I believe to be absent with the bodies, to be present with the Lord, as Christ said. Uh, I do believe in um, specifically demons interacting with the world quietly uh unaware i also believe that uh there are times throughout the bible and potentially in the modern age where uh god gives a momentary like lapse where people mm -hmm. um either go back and talk to people still on earth or angels directly mm -hmm. interact with people i believe in supernatural like that but not the idea that you die and then you just wander yeah, yeah i'm I, I definitely don't think of ghosts as like souls trapped on earth for me it's more of a like like we talked, we mentioned like dimensional tears and stuff like that, yeah. and the tearing of the space time fabric. To me, it's more of something along those lines, or perhaps a fragment of somebody. What the hell's that? My little sister is calling me. Um, that's some sort of fragmentation. Just put her on, throw her in front of five hundred <laughs> people. <laughs> she would not like that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of that's where I net out with it. I definitely had some experiences that to me seemed like less than demon, more than wind. 
so that's where I am. I don't know. I, I don't think I would be confident in saying what I think the true nature is, but I do believe that there's something out there. Um, let's see. Uh, AZ Larson said, Hey guys, love this. Keep up God's good work. Wendigoon read C.S. Lewis, that hideous strength for some good Christian horror. Part of his space trilogy. Also, the last act in Paralandra is awesomely creepy. That was addressed that to you. That hideous strength for some good Christian horror? What on earth? Is that hideous strength the name of the I imagine. I that sounds think. incredible. Where yeah, I'll it? check that out. Yes, be, Lewis is I need cool to read guy. some more Lewis. I've only read Absolutely. Chronicles of Narnia. That sounds cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for the $20, uh, of course. Thank you all for the money. I've, yes. I'm a little tired. I've been working all day, which is why I'm not We're as like, exhausted. oh, thank you for this. Thank you for that. We're working on a big project together, which is why we've been together the past few days. Yeah. And I'm a little sneaky, so I'm fine. <laughs> but the thing. And we still have to film things tonight. Yes, <laughs> we still have to go. So thank you all very much for the project. Oh. Uh, Jack Hewn said, besides the KJV version, what other versions of the Bible would you recommend for a good study Bible? Uh, the versions that take the same methodology for translation, you would have the NKJV, the ASB, and the NASB. The ESV and the NESV, uh, those are all reliable. Um, the, the ESV and ASV are written in language that will be easier to understand. The N, the new versions of all of them are updated for modernized English, whereas the, uh, the ASV and the ESV actually are the same translation for the most part, but there were publishing issues. That's why they ended up being separate. They, the, the ASV and the ESV were created by a team of American and British scholars to try and create a standard version for the English-speaking world. Uh, the end result was they could not agree on publishing, and so they were published as two separate copies, but they use the same methodology. They translate directly from the sources. They don't go through a Latin or a Greek translation. Those are all very reliable, very good. Um, and then for the Old Testament, if you want to get something that is... Uh, a good reference for timing, a translation of the original Septuagint would be solid because that'll give you, it's not direct from Hebrew, but it does have more contextual translation than the later direct translations do. Um, for example, the Orthodox Church and I think the Roman Catholic Church both default to the Septuagint when there is a conflict between the Septuagint and newer translations because of that context. Do you have thoughts other than that? I've I've uh, done the KJV my whole life and have never fathomed another one. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty straightforward. If you'd ask me to, if you, uh, the question, what other versions would you recommend? The answer would be none. Uh, pretty pretty yeah. diehard. Yeah, the Baptist in you. <laughs> it's it's literally the Baptist. In me. Uh, do super chats to the best religious podcast count as a thing? As tithing. I think. Oh, I can't read. No. <laughs> Dude, no. Dude, we are not. No. We are not harboring the Lord's money. Do not put that on. <laughs> will Will I donate a percentage of my income this year to the sure, church? Sure, yes. sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But, yeah. Would but, I consider, would you, should you consider this tithing? No. This is not, um, this is not in the Lord's depository. No, this is not going directly to God. So, uh, yeah, I am, yeah. I am not the uh, uh, steward of his money. Yeah. A percentage wills. Give give that to him. I also think you don't necessarily have to just throw it at you know your local church. You can go to charity. Yeah. Uh, got, got, lo, the Lord said, if you give a loaf of bread in my name, I will bless you for it. Yeah. So uh, re, that that's obviously not referring to yeah. throwing it in the church offering plate, like yeah. you know donations, blessings of people. That's giving it to God. Throwing it at people who have enough money to you know, rent a cabin for the weekend to shoot cool videos. No, I not do, do not put, that's not tithing. But, <laughs> put that, on but if you come that up, being said, I appreciate yes, it immensely. Very much. It means the world. It allows us to do this. It means to mo the most to me that it possibly can. And I appreciate yes. it, but I'm not God. <laughs> <laughs> Good clarification. There. Um, you know, I, things that would count as tithing and also thank you for calling us the best religious podcast. I, appreciate I Yeah, that. I appreciate that. Too, um, thank you. You know, stuff that I, I would say would count as tithing. Um, you're in line at Starbucks and the person in front of you seems to be struggling to pull together the cash to, to pay for their latte, paying it forward to help somebody who's struggling. Something like that. Simple as it is. Uh, you know, 
buying food for a homeless person on the street, uh, buying a bus ticket for someone who can't afford it, little stuff like that. That's going to be the same kind of thing. If you're doing it because it's the right thing to do, you know, that, that counts in my opinion, but also very simply, if, you know, if your church is trying to do a youth trip to a national park or something like that, then you donate 20 bucks. I think that also would count, you know, help your, help your community first. Cause your community, if your community is strong, your community can help other communities. So to clarify, this is the KJV. People were like, did he say KGB? A lot of people it's make not that the KGB. Mistake. It's the KJV, King right. James Version. That appears to be all of them, which is good because... We have other yeah. stuff to do. We I will say the last too. question that I saw people asking, but not a super chat, was when will you all do more Missing 411 content? <laughs> it's funny you ask that. Well, I wonder why we're in a cabin together in the Smoky Mountains. <laughs> definitely not for weird missing person stuff uh but very soon very soon yes so all right quite you could even say right now perhaps <laughs> and perhaps. for us at least perhaps we are filming something in a few minutes yeah. um so all right thank you guys so much for watching thank, thank you, you for those who here. supported the show with super chats and we will catch you on the next one except for benjamin yeah. chapman just said can you cover the story of noah's ark i think that that one is in the Genesis episode, but uh, I feel like we did. We definitely did a flood episode. We did a flood episode. Let, yeah. let me see. It's, it's better. Um, uh, nope, that's not what I wanted. Uh, let's see. Flood. By, nope, that's not it. It's We did, we talked about it in the Genesis one, I'm pretty sure. I know there was a, a flood video somewhere. I just need to Oh, on your channel. Well, I feel like we did it together, but maybe not. Um, playlists. I know we talked about it. Weird Bible. I would provide commentary, but... I'm yeah. normally going to go for like four hours. I know. Tonight thing. we got more yeah. stuff to do. Maybe we didn't have one. All right. I I would... No, no, no. We I know for a fact me and you talked about first. Maybe I mean, was... it would be in... No, may, uh, we Wouldn't might it? have done it on a Lore Lodge episode because I've been on that a few times, oh, too. Oh, that's also possible. I think that's what it was. Um, I, I'll find it. I put will it find it. Description. And I... Yeah. I, okay. Um, I'll find it and I'll put it in the description of this video. Um, can, I'm sure that we could do an episode on specifically the flood, yeah. but... Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, I recently learned that Noah took seven pairs of each clean animal, not just two of each animal. I have not heard that one, but I'd be interested to. Yeah, so. he brought seven. Seven of each Yeah, because clean they had to, uh, for while they were on the ark, they had to do the sacrifice. Oh, so they, oh they okay. So seven, seven of the sacrificial animals. Yes, seven of the sacrificial animals. The because they Got were it. on there for seven years. Or yeah, like, I was going to say. They, did, they didn't want to Seven years on the ark. Five years. They're in there. They're on the ark for forty days and forty nights. No, it rained for forty days and forty nights. They were in there for five years. What? Yeah. Really? Yes, they were in there for that long, and then whenever they got on the mountaintop, that's when they let out the birds, and they would wait to see if it would come back and all that. How did I miss that? Your own fault. I mean, it is my fault. Grow I guess, up, but I'm grow up, I guess. Guess, guess I need to go reread. I think, I think it was again. five years, if I remember correctly. They were on there. Um, it rained for forty days and forty nights. Yeah, and then, they, then they, they, it took that five years for the water to go down. You need to go read that again. Okay, it's bugging me. But all right, that's it. Thank you guys so what? much. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Your donations mean the world. We appreciate it. All right. Thank you so much. We will see you guys on the next one. Have a nice night.